Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me back for this uh, session on uh, climate change impacts on butterflies and moths. Uh, climate change and its impacts is a subject dear to my heart, um, as many of you will already know. Um, and as by way of an introduction, uh, this chart, which this slide which you can see, features a butterfly made from wildflowers, which was given to me by, um, as on a card, given to me by an Extinction Rebellion activist who was staying with us for one of the rebellions here in London. And I think it shows nicely the interaction between butterflies and the natural world. The other thing on this chart, which you can see is the warming stripes, uh, which is developed by a researcher in Reading University. And this shows the relative warmth rel compared with the average of 1971 to 2000 um, for the UK over the 50 year period from 1970 to 2019. And basically redder means hotter and dark red means even hotter. So um, you can see that um, things are getting hotter as you move later in the years. Just a couple of words about me before I get going on the presentation proper. As Epiphany said, I'm a trustee. Uh, I also chair the Surrey and Southwest London branch of Butterfly Conservation. I live in London. I spend most of my time um, working on the green spaces in London, working with the boroughs to try and make those green spaces better for butterflies and actually finding out that London is pretty good for butterflies and moths and it's probably getting better, which is a contrast to the countryside. Last year, I went on a cycle ride through the country from Land's End to John O'Groats, spent a lot of time in Scotland and loved it. And you'll hear a little bit about that as we go through the talk. <clears throat> so what I'm going to cover is a bit about the climate emergency, why Lepidoptera are good indicators. We'll talk about some of the most obvious changes which we see, which is to do with distribution. We'll talk a bit about phenology, why averages are not necessarily the most relevant thing, and we'll finish with what we can do. I would point out that I'm not a climate change expert and I'm not an expert on all the topics I'm going to mention. This is meant to be an introduction to show you the scale of the challenge which we are facing, both in terms of the climate and its impacts. It's, it's illustrated with pictures that I've taken, mostly on my uh, phone, like these common butterflies in the park near me in London. Uh, quite a rare sighting to see commas doing this. First of all, the climate emergency. And um, this chart is meant to indicate why we should be worried. On the left-hand side, you've got the CO2 measurements at the Hawaii Observatory from 1960 onwards. Um, and as you can see, the trend hasn't, hasn't stopped. The CO2 levels which drive climate change are just going up and up. Um, despite 26 COPs, uh, the trend hasn't changed. There's no blip for the pandemic, no blip for the recession in 2008. And if anything, the rate of change is increasing, gone up from 0.6 to 2.3 parts per million per year. So, there's no cause for complacency there, despite all the actions that people have taken and the things that they think are in train. On the right hand side of this chart, you've got the two recent IPCC reports, uh, which are huge uh, sources of information, lots and lots of research into them. Uh, the one on the left, the physical science basis came out in August last year, and the one on the right, the impacts of climate change and ad adaptation came out in February. Um, the UN Secretary General called climate change a code red for humanity. The left-hand report talked about 1.5 degrees C warming being almost unachievable. And the right-hand report talked about any further delay, meaning we will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So the, there's a big red light flashing that could hardly be flashing more strongly. Um, and if you want to be really worried, then look at the warming based on the post-COP nationally determined contributions. That's looking at 2.4 degrees C. If all the promises are delivered on time, by everybody. So it's 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 a concern, but it's not a concern for the future, it's a concern for now. Um, and these two pictures illustrate that. The first one shows the flooding in London last year, including a flood, flooded underground station. And the second one shows the highest ever temperature in the UK achieved in July, 2019, 38.7 degrees, uh, with a minimum of 19.4 on that, that day. Um, so it's here, it's now, it's not something for the future, it's something to be worried about here and now. <clears throat> um, this talk borrows a lot from a talk uh, made by Richard Fox at the AGM in 2020, and another one by Marcus Rhodes from the University of Exeter, but it's got lots of my own material in as well. So I want to acknowledge those two speakers. Um, the first thing to point out is that butterflies and moths are very good indicators of climate change. And you can see the small skipper on the right here in its range indicated um, because th th they are cold-blooded, 
so they're sensitive to changes in temperature, but they're also at the climatic range margins in the UK. So small changes make a big difference to them. Uh, the reproductive rates are rapid and they're able to disperse quite quickly. So we see the changes um, uh, more apparently than we probably would with, with some other species groups. But critically, we've got a lot of data on butterflies and moths over a long period of time. Um, in some cases, hundreds of years, but the, the, the data since the 1970s is really rich. And even here in London, in my area of, of Surrey, um, we walk something like 120 plus transects every year. So the amount of data is phenomenal that we've got to work on. And, and we can see those effects very clearly. Um, we're now going to talk about distribution and how butterflies and moths are changing their distribution. And this is a story of winners and losers. I'm not going to go through details of all of these. Um, but I will talk about some of them. Um, the Jersey tiger, I talk, the Jersey tiger is a moth which we see now in London very commonly in July and August. Uh, appears in moth traps. Some people have dozens, multiple dozens in their moth traps here. Um, but it wasn't seen 15 years ago. It was not unknown. Uh, so it's spreading really quickly. The brown nagus similarly is spreading into London. Um, it now feeds on geranium species and has taken advantage of the the better parks and gardens here. Uh, and it's moving as well. So there are species and it's moving north and that's becoming a problem perhaps for the northern brown argus too, as they overlap. But we're going to deep more details on one or two of these species now. <clears throat> First of all, the comma. And I think you're probably familiar with this story. And I'm sorry, I don't have a more up-to-date distribution map on, on the right here. This is taken from the latest State of the UK's butterflies uh, in 2015, because I know now that the comma has been seen uh, as far north as the north of Scotland. Um, and it's it's prevalent all across the range now. Um, and it's moved 450 kilometers since the 70s, 11 kilometers a year. And that's an astonishing rate of movement for, for a butterfly to, to move north across the countryside. Um, and critical to that success was its transitioning from feeding not just on elms, but to feed on net and hops, but to feed on nettles as well, which obviously much more widespread across the whole territory. So the comma has responded really quickly. I can remember being brought up when I was brought up in Dorset, a comma was a was a, was a was a rare rareish sight, and now we see them very commonly, including in London. Um, then the ringlet, uh, you'll be familiar with this story in Scotland. I was told as I cycled north last year, the ringlet was unknown in Cumbria before about 2012, and similarly in parts of Scotland from before that sort of time. But I saw lots, um, particularly as I was trying to hunt down the mountain ringlet, which was a bit annoying. Um, and this one was taken in Wishaw Park in Glasgow last year, a bit scruffy, I'm afraid. Um, this is one of the parks of the Helping Hands project that, uh, that you, you guys are doing in Scotland. Uh, so yeah, the ringlet is now prevalent across the whole of the range there. Uh, but it's not just the temperature, as with the shown by the comma, you need to have the right habitat. And habitat in, in the speckled wood, it seems that habitat availability is limiting the spread as you go north of Yorkshire. Um, and um, the more readily available habitat in Scotland means it's, it's jumped up to there and it's now very prevalent in, in the northern parts of Scotland as well. So it's not just the climate uh, needs to be right, it's other, all the other factors need to be right for the butterfly or moths uh, to, to spread. But moths are moving north too. And this is taken from the State of UK Moths Report last year from 487 species. And you can see that uh, on the horizontal axis, this to the right means moving north, uh, and the vertical axis is the number of species. And you can see that pretty much all of them have moved north. The darker bars are statistically significant. So most of these changes are significant. And the average is five kilometers per year. So on average, moths are moving north, these species at least, uh, five kilometers a year. And some of them 10, 15, even 20 kilometers per year, which is again, astonishing. So the changes we see um, are, are current and they're marked and they're quite, quite noticeable. But it's not all good news, of course. And uh, in the next talk, Liz will talk about um, cool adapted moths. And this is one of those examples where the gray mountain carpet is moving north and it's moving up and its distribution has massively decreased in the last few years, as you can see from this chart. So there are struggles for some of our cold adapted species and that will come onto that in the next one, which is the mountain ringlet. Um, I struggled to see this last year as I was he heading north had to go up to Ben Laws uh, Reserve, north of Loch Tay. Uh, and I was up at about 500 meters above sea level 
in order to see the species. And it was mixing up with the ordinary units, as I said. But it is repeated, retreating north and uh, to higher ground. And the chart on the left shows the percentage of extinction squares in relation to uh, altitude. And uh, it's a simple chart, but just shows that at, at lower altitudes, there are more extinction squares than there are at higher altitudes. So again, the mountain ringer is but, but it's our only one tame species, and it may be one which is going to struggle if climate change continues as we think it will. Um, so we talked a bit about distribution and how, in some cases, distribution is increasing, and this seems to be a quote good news story. But but I want to bring into that um, equation abundance because quite often we see increasing distributions but decreasing abundances, and people find that hard to get their head around. This is taken from the Atlas of Britain's Moths uh, from 2019, a fantastic book, 104 species. And I've plotted distribution on the horizontal and abundance on the vertical axis. And that's over a, over a relatively short period of uh, what, what uh, 40 years or so. Um, and there are some moths which are increasing in both abundance and distribution, but mostly they are decreasing in abundance. And over half of them are in what I call the the, the extinction quadrant where they're decreasing in distribution and decreasing in abundance. So uh, we have to be careful as we're interpreting the distribution changes that sometimes it's not, not, not always good news. Um, and then I just want to bring into uh, the equation the, the tortoise shells, small tortoise shells. Um, as I was cycling north last year, I saw quite a lot of tortoise shells around Cumbria and places like that in Carlisle, lots on a road verge in Carlisle, it was full of tortoise shells. In, that was July, um, but in, in London in the southeast, we see very see very few tortoise shells in the second generation. Uh, we see, see relatively good numbers of the first ones out of hibernation. Um, and uh, what I suspect is happening is that these these butterflies and the peacocks as well, as you can see on the right, are hibernating earlier to escape from warmer weather. Um, and Malcolm Howell from Hearts Middlesex Branch has done a study on this, which you've got a link to there, and these slides will be available afterwards, so you can see that. Um, so I, I think that they may be, because they've got to survive the, from when they emerge in the summer in July uh, through to eight, March, April next year to mate and, and lay eggs, um, the strategy seems to be to hunker down and avoid the warm weather. And I just point out here that in Japan, tortoise shells are an alpine species. They're only found in the Alps of, of Japan. So maybe they're cold adapted as well, and we just don't appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> now just a word about sea level rise. Uh, it's not something we mention very often, but it's, it is in our latest butterfly magazine with a rather nice article about the swallowtail and how the broads in Norfolk are very sensitive to sea level rise uh, and uh, salinification of, the, of those broads and then the loss of the habitat. And you can see that the two degree temperature rise Hickling Broad will lose 85% of its area. Um, so these are very real effects on a very uh, restricted butterfly with particular habitat requirements. Um, the picture is always changing, of course. Uh, we think of the flora and fauna we've got now as what we already had, but that's not the case. Um, things are always changing. And um, here are some future residents of, that could come in and probably are here already. We see good numbers of long-tailed blues in Surrey and Sussex most years. Uh, the large tortoiseshell uh, is known on Portland Bill, and we've seen him, some in Surrey last year too. Um, I fully expect that to be back and breeding. Um, I'm not sure whether the colony on Portland Bill is introduced or not, but, but I suspect that there will be an established presence soon, if not already. And the southern small white, we're just waiting for that to jump the channel. We know that small whites and large whites migrate, of course, across the channel, so the small, southern small white could easily do so as well. Um, and it's present on the continent, places like Netherlands in, in very large numbers. And since 2000, I've just put out there that 50 odd moth species have arrived or returned. But I just wanted to mention that, of course, some of these are unwittingly imported by ourselves. And two that we have trouble with now in the London area in the southeast are the box tree moth, which is busy ravaging the box hedges in, uh, in gardens here, and the oak processionary moth, which is now established in, in uh, London in the southeast and is spreading gradually across the country, despite all the efforts by the Forestry Commission to contain it. Now I want to move on to phenology. I'm not going to talk, talk much about the urban heat island, except to mention um, that that's relevant here in London, of course, and probably had an impact on this picture I show you here on the right, which is a ripe, back, ripe blackberry on the 1st of July 2020. I've never seen blackberries ripe in July before, 
and I just this is important I think because you can see all the blackberries here have gone past the the uh, the bramble flowers uh, and this is before the first gatekeepers have emerged and so the fa their favored nectaring plant is just not not there. I'm going to mention nature's calendar a citizen science project and then I'm going to talk about moths the difference between single and multi-generation species and the development and trap of an extra brood. So these phenological changes are quite significant. And this uh, Nature's Calendar is, a, as I said, a citizen science project uh, led by the Woodland Trust with the UK CEH and funded by the People's Postcode Lottery. Um, and it looks at average dates compared with the 2001 benchmark year. They publish them every year and they, the website's there for you to look at. Um, but what you can see is these negative numbers represent an earlier day than the benchmark year. Whether we've got bud leaf, bud burst, first leaf, etc. You can read the list. Uh, you can see that not only are these numbers negative, so earlier than benchmark, but they're getting more negative on, in general. So the trend is increasing, uh, and 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 we can see that in the spring, which we're having now, in fact, where uh, trees are in, in, in bud much earlier than normal. <clears throat> and those phenology changes appear in our moths as well. This is taken uh, from the moth atlas again. Um, <clears throat> You can see the gray birch now flies about a month earlier at peak and the sharp handled peacock not only is the first brood coming earlier but the second brood is now much bigger than it used to be and is later um, so big changes which are easily observed over a pretty short time frame right this is from the 70s to the 2000s so um, a short time frame for a big difference <clears throat> but some moths are flying later of course this is taken from the atlas again and um this, this, these moths, pink barred sallow, now about a week or two later than it used to be, uh, because it's warmer in September and October than it was back in the back in the seventies. <clears throat> um, but the phenology changes are more subtle than that in some cases. This is a paper which uh, was written by Callum McGregor in a couple of years ago. Callum joined me uh, on my ride last year to go and visit the silver studded blues at Priest Heath Common. Uh, reserve, which is a fantastic success story for BC. But this, this chart, which is an extract from a much bigger study that he did, shows the difference between a, a one generation univoltine and multivoltine species, the silver study blue and the small blue. In both cases, there's an advancing phenology, as the charts show in the middle there. Uh, but the silver study blue is declining in abundance and is retracting its range, and the small blue is increasing in abundance and expanding its range. And, and the postulation is this is due to the larger second brood in the small brood being successful more often and feeding then um, the overwintering and the and the subsequent years. Uh, but it gets more complicated than that. Um, and I think you're probably familiar with the wall brown as a species uh, that used to be common across much of uh, England. And it's been lost from the central part of England here. There's a big gap where the wall brown used to be. I used to see it often, and we've we've lost it from Surrey now. Don't see any, um, and it's now limited mainly to coastal areas and the north. Um, and you can see the massive changes in distribution and abundance. And you're probably familiar with this story because it's a bit of a, um, uh, a a poster case, and it appears in in uh, Peter Reel's book as well from this paper by Hans van Dyck and and, and the co-authors. But this introduces a notion of a developmental trap where in cooler climes, northern areas, um, there are two broods and in warm climes, there are three broods. And this is important because this butterfly overwinters as a third in star larva only. And if it's a bit warm, but not quite warm enough, then the, the, it tries to put in this third brood, doesn't get to third in star and you risk a lost generation. And that seems to be what's happening in the middle of England uh, with, the, with the wall brown. But all that talk there really has been about averages, but it's not about averages. I want to introduce the, the uh, concept of microclimate and microhabitat and extreme weather events as well. And I just took this picture from a cover of a book showing a, um, a heat map of a piece of grassland showing the differences in temperature being extremely marked. We don't normally think about that, but as this is one of my favorite sites in, in uh, London area, Hutchinson's Banks, a London wildlife site with, I think, 40 species found on transect here, probably one of the best butterfly sites in London. Um, but just, just, in, just to introduce the theme of microclimate and, and to get your thinking about the differences in temperature 
between the ambient air temperature, the effect of short sword or long sword, grassy tussocks, the bare ground, which you can see here, scrubby areas, etc. And I and and even in the canopy of trees, big differences in an oak tree canopy in different parts. Um, I don't think we appreciate perhaps how important this is to our wildlife, um, except we know that butterflies like the bare ground here, the uh, silver spotted skipper, which I'll talk about uh, so uh, in just a, just a minute. Um, so this is a study of the silver spotted skipper in, in Sussex from a few years ago. And this is about 10 kilometers by five or six kilometers. And it shows the same area in 1982 and 2000. And um, they modeled the thermal quality of habitat um, down to a five meter resolution. So quite detailed study. And the colors show the number of hours when the ground temperature or near ground temperature was above 25 degrees C, which is what the silver star Still spotted skipper needs for flight. It doesn't fly below that during its August flight period. And you can see that, that um, the bold, air, bold outlines show where the butterfly was present, just a few places present in 1982, many more places present in 2000. So it's expanded from these, these um, um, uh, refuge, po refuge populations to spread out into, into quite an area into, into other places. Um, where it where it's now got a warm enough microclimate and this is a microclimate effect not a macro climate effect that we're seeing here so silver spotted silver spotted skipper is doing relatively well in parts of surrey and sussex now where the food plant and and sward can be managed appropriately um <clears throat> next thing i want to mention is is extreme weather events like like droughts and um there were two which you remember if, if you remember like me you were at school in 1976 a drought there which you can see was a, an anomaly Another one in 1995. Um, I remember vividly the, the drought in 1976 only ending when a minister for drought was appointed and had deluge soon after that. But what we see is that, that um, uh, a crash in butterfly numbers in the subsequent years and then a recovery for wider countryside species and not for habitat specialists. Um, and that tells us another story as well. But droughts, cl climatically extreme years which are going to increase in number and in severity have a big impact on our on our flora and fauna, particularly our butterflies and moths. Um, and the '95 drought, this is from work by by uh, Oliver et al. and uh, Martin Moran quotes this: um, ringlet green vein white large white or massive effects on the summer populations of the drought on the butterfly populations in subsequent years. Um, <clears throat> now we're coming on to the the risk of being a habitat specialist, and there are two papers I reference here: one by Martin Moran one by Richard Fox, um, uh, but looking at the impacts of land use changes and climate changes um, on butterfly and moth biodiversity, um, ending up with fewer species dominated by mobile and widespread generalists. And the hybrid fertility is a, is a good example here, uh, where, where the theory is that nitrogen deposition from um, the fertilizer plumes from Northern Ireland coming into Cumbria, causing uh, rich growth in the under, in the understory of the bracken, and uh, and the food plants and, and microclimate is uh, changed, so it's cooler than they like. Um, so yes, hard to see the high brown fertility now, uh, and and risks of being a habitat special are very significant. Um, <clears throat> now, as I come to the close, I want to move on to show why 1.5 degree C is such a challenge. Uh, for for us, and we talk about the supply side, and we talk about the the demand side. Um, <clears throat> so this chart shows um, uh, the, the CO two emissions by primary source. You can see it's pretty much all fossil fuels, a bit of uh, cement manufacture, and and land use and deforestation. Um, but for a 50 50 chance of staying below 1.5 CO two, there's a there's a carbon budget remaining we could emit of about 400 gigatons of CO2. It's taken by, from a blog um, by, by a guy at Shell. Um, and our global CO2 emissions are about 42 gigatons per year. So that means um, we've got about 10 years before we use up all our CO2 budget. Uh, and that gives us to the end of the decade, which is why action is really, really um, uh, urgent and it needs to be extreme. The other reason why it's a challenge is looking at the demand side. And this, if you haven't found this, this website called carbon.place, it's a 
mine of information which looks at the um, carbon footprint by by area and it goes down to very small areas uh, so i can compare dulwich with sw9 where i live with dorking a town in in surrey and look at the carbon footprint for those areas in terms of kilograms of co2 equivalent per person um, and you can see we've got in the blue box blue lines at the top electricity gas transport and flights but in each case the bulk of the carbon footprint comes from consumption of goods and services so things we do and and the way we live our lives is causing the major carbon footprint um, and so it's not just about other people doing stuff and and uh, uh, changing you know where the energy comes from it's how we how we manage our lives as well it's probably going to have a major effect and that's not a story you hear very much but that's why it's going to be such a challenge for us to get down to keep down to 1.5 degrees c so um just in conclusion then um i think it's pretty clear that we're moving into a phase where it's going to become hotter we see that already uh but with more extremes uh, more droughts more floods and that's not something which is for 5, 10, 15, 20 years away from it, us. It's something here for here and now. Um, but the picture of the impacts that that has on, on our butterfly and moth, uh, butterflies and moths is complex. We're seeing new arrivals. So we talked about you know, the long tail blue or the or the um, large tortoise shell, for example. Uh, we're, and we're seeing extinctions both locally and nationally, uh, species as it gets too warm for them or too dry or whatever. We're seeing lots of range expansions. We saw that with the comma, for example, speckled wood, uh, ringlet, and range extractions for the cold adapted species uh, like the mountain ringlet and so on. Um, the, the effects get complicated by land use changes. So you know, how things are being done there means that it's a complex picture. Uh, and phenology is something we should worry about, I think, because if things get out of sync, um, then you know, where, where are the bramble flowers to for the for the uh, summer butterflies the gatekeepers and so on to feed on if those things get out of sync that's a problem uh more of a problem if it happens with food plants of course uh, larval food plants um there are different effects on different life stages i didn't show some charts but i could have done because of time but uh, um adults being affected differently from uh, hibernating adults from 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 other other life stages um and we've also seen that microclimate and microhabitat have, have an important effect. So the, comp the picture quickly gets complicated. Um, and then, of course, we're facing more extreme weather events. We know that from, from what we've seen, um, more droughts, more floods. Uh, and these will be problems. If you have floods like we had in Germany washing away last year, washing away whole swathes of countryside area, then the wildlife goes with it. <clears throat> so the likelihood, I think, is in the in the in the shorter term, we're going to see fewer species dominated by mobile and widespread habitat generalists, um, and the specialists are going to be the ones who struggle first. And we see that with the work which we do in butterfly conservation for the specialist species like the high brown fertility and so on, which need those particular um, conditions to thrive. Um, and I'll leave you with a with, with a quote here from Dan Hoare about the impacts of climate change on butterflies and moths are rapid, varied, and unpredictable. So we need to do everything we can to limit climate change. Um, the, the, I, I guess my final closing remark would be that we, we talk about the climate emergency, but we don't behave like it's an emergency. Uh, we behave like with COVID. We talked about that as an emergency. There was an emergency response. Ukraine, an emergency, an emergency response. But that's not what we see with uh, climate change, I'm afraid. So I'm not very optimistic about where we go with this. And just as I close, I want to make sure I have acknowledged all the people I've referenced. You can see the, the various references there, but particularly the presentations by Richard Fox at the AGM and Marcus Rhodes, uh, which is both of which are available on YouTube and both are very good. So with that, leave with a painted lady from 2009 and uh, hand back to Epiphany for Q&A and I'll stop my share here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, for your very important and very timely keynote. Uh, I find the graph that you showed on your second slide particularly alarming because, as you point out, there is no blip on that graph relating to 
COVID lockdown measures, which I'm sure most people already found to be a huge lifestyle change for them. So I find that quite quite scary. Um, but thanks, that was a, that was a great talk, and we're ahead of schedule, so we have a lot of time for questions. Got one here from Jim Asher saying, uh, "From your experience of the oil industry, are the big players in the industry doing enough? Do you think?" Um, but. I'd make a disclosure here that I used to work for Shell for many years, so... Um, um, it's okay, we forgive you. <laughs> um, <laughs> do I think they're doing enough? Um, I think they're doing more than they are given credit for. Um, and I think that companies like Shell, which I used to work for, are trying to work in line with what governments and societies are doing around them. Um, do I think that's enough? No, I don't. Um, I think we need to get out of fossil fuels faster than you could see the, the, the chart I showed of the remaining budget for fossil fuels is, is 400 gigatons of CO2. And we're going to use it up in 10 years if we're not careful. So we're not moving fast enough, clearly. Um, I think the companies like Shell are doing more than people appreciate, but I don't think it's enough, if I put it that way. Yeah. And Jim also points out, um, of course, the impact that the war in Ukraine might have on climate and emissions as well. And then Nigel comes in further down and says this might have a, a positive effect because it will accelerate our, our movement towards renewable energy sources. Do you, do you have anything to add to that, Simon? I kind of disagree with that because you see Germany moving back into coal. A lot of German coal is lignite. Um, it's very dirty coal. Um, you see the government here in the UK talking about fracking again. Um, complete waste of time, in my view, because by the time you get the, the oil out of the ground, it's going to be too late, mm -hmm. be five years plus to do that. Um, and the simple truth is, if had we uh, moved to a more renewables diet of, for energy um, earlier, we would not be facing the rises in fuel prices, which we're going to see now. So I think we're, we're reaping what we've sown, frankly, and I don't feel I don't feel at all optimistic that Ukraine is going to is going to accelerate things. Um, so I don't think that's the response of government. They could have said, "Let's accelerate our renewables program." They didn't. They said, "Let's." It's under pressure to increase fracking, right? So, um, uh, or to you know to keep North Sea going for longer, or blah blah blah. You know. Okay, I'm just going to check the questions box. Um... We have Zoe Weir saying, Simon, should we be trying to reduce our own footprints by concentrating on conservation efforts in our own neighborhoods rather than driving or flying to see nature? Um, I think, and I, I hesitate to tell people what to do, not my job, um, but I think we've got to do anything and everything we can at all levels, personal and business and government. Um, and only if we all do everything will we have a slim chance of averting the disaster so personally yes i've kind of given up flying um uh, i've kind of given up driving a car i've kind of given up meat you know and i so i think um these are the sorts of things which people are going to have to do if we're going to to um make the change needed uh and there is and i don't see that as a particular sacrifice actually I, because there's such a fantastic wealth of wildlife and things to look at in this country uk as a whole I don't find that to be at all um, a, 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 a restriction, really. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel when I was younger, so maybe that's different for younger people. But um, no, so I think basically every, we've got to do everything we can if we're going to avert climate change, right? Because we know the effects are going to be there. They're with us now and they're going to get worse. Absolutely. Um, and, and you obviously survived your, your bicycle ride the length of the country. So you're living proof that it's perfectly possible to uh, do all of this and to see excellent species here in the UK. Um, OK, we've got a few questions that have gone into the chat function at the side. So I'm just going to go through these. Um, there's a comment here from Nigel saying ecotourism still has an important role to play. There are many very threatened habitats and species in the developing world which are only protected because of the income produced by visitors. So kind of related to the, to yeah, yeah. the last question. Um, 
Peter Robinson says, can you please explain a little bit more about cold adapted species and how climate change is affecting them? Well, I hesitate to go too far on that because Elizabeth- There is, is another talk about this, right, Peter, so- about that, but, yep. but, but I think <laughs> we tend to think of butterflies and moths as being warm adapted, but I, don't, but I think the truth is that many of them are cool adapted and because we're at the range margins here, it's, we get both. And I think, you know, I'd love to see some more research on the, on the um, uh, small tortoise shell and peacock in the south as to how that, if they are really cold adapted or not, because I, I have the suspicion that they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that's everything. People, uh, some interesting just comments from people. Um, speckled wood recorded in, on Shetland for the first time last year. Um, interesting that COVID lockdown didn't produce a dip in global warming, just shows the massive change we all need to make to have an impact. Um, so lots of people enjoyed your talk. I think, Simon, it's, it's generated some, some good uh, discussion. Oh, there's one more question. What about log burning stoves? We feel the need to keep this as our secondary heating until the price of greener electricity becomes cheaper. Do you have any comments about this? Yeah, I think you know, people have to make personal decisions based on their own circumstances and what's available to them, I think. Um, I'm not here to tell other people how to how to live their lives. Um, I would possibly make one remark, personally, about butterfly conservation and as trustees. You know, we, we've pushed quite hard for there to be a sustainability plan uh, at, um, at a beast for butterfly conservation. And that's in that, that people should know that's in progress, the development of that. Um, and it's essentially about putting our own house in order, yeah. um, uh, doing things as we should, and increasing the amount of lobbying that BC does on the climate agenda. And uh, those who watch what, what the BC team are doing will see that that's massively increased in the last year or so, hasn't it? We see a lot more lobbying um, which, which trustees are very pleased about, and I'm sure many of the members are very pleased about too. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a shift um, in the way BC are starting to talk about climate change, which is really, really good, um, and lots going on behind the scenes, as you say, to put our own house in order. Um, I have one final question for you, Simon. Uh, I know that on the board, we're both very passionate about climate change, and no doubt you also experience these moments of kind of just slight hopelessness at the scale and the complexity of the problem. So I wondered if you could share uh, just something positive, a bit of advice for our listeners on how you try to overcome it and stay stay positive and hopeful during these difficult times. Yeah, it is. There is a lot of climate anxiety out there amongst people who will get, get concerned about climate change um, and see impacts on things that they love, whether it's whether it's the butterflies and moths or, or whatever else or, or people in other countries. Um, I think you've got to stay positive. I think you've got to personally think about what what can you do. What can you do yourself? Um, how do you spend your time? What do you spend your time on? Um, uh, how do you talk about it? Um, are you upfront about there being a problem? Um, uh, and and you know you you can make change. You know you you can lobby people for change. You can you can make small changes in your own life, which which are important. I and mean, I'm not here to tell people how to live, but. Um, if you spend some time looking at carbon dot place as a website, which I showed in the later charts, um, lots of indications there about how much people consume. And I think the, the issue, I think, is that with the media and the politicians tell us that the problem is, is the energy supply side, it's, it's fossil fuels. And the answer is, yes, it is. But it's also what we do ourselves, right? It's the consumption side. And I, and I tried to make that clear in there that we all have a role to play in terms of how, how we live our lives, um, how we consume stuff. And unfortunately, it's such a big problem that, that it's easy for people to get overwhelmed by it and say, I can't do anything. But you know, if we all do a bit, it will help, right? Absolutely, that's a great answer. Uh, collective effort, um, we can all do a small thing to help butterflies and moths. So thank you very much, Simon. I think I've... Um, I've, I've read out all of the questions. Just to remind everybody, um, please put your questions in the Q&A box because it's much easier for me to find them. And yes, thank you very much, Simon, for joining us again. Um, as always, you give a great talk with lots of nice uh, visuals to help us understand things. And uh, we hope to have you back again in the future. Thank you, Simon.
Well, uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, this is, I think, the third time I've uh, tried to do this. Um, so uh, hopefully third time lucky, but you can see my moths are definitely alive. Um, <laughs> so th this is a, uh, a chestnut, a, a very common um, autumn moth that hibernates as an adult and uh, comes out again in the spring. So uh, I, I live in, I'm lucky enough to live in King Usi. Um, the the uh, spring hasn't really arrived here yet. So I've been trying to catch moths over the last week. Um, and on uh, Tuesday night, we had snow. On Wednesday night, I went out and I ran two uh, large traps, two mercury vapor traps um, at RSPB's Inch Marshes Reserve um, in the hope of getting Rannoch Sprawler. But unfortunately, uh, the, the weather was poor. Um, it was very cold. Uh, it, was, it was quite wet. It was quite windy. Um, and I uh, failed to get Rannoch Sprawler, but I did catch uh, six moths. Now, what was very interesting, only two of those moths were in my big, very bright uh, mercury vapor traps, which I ran from about seven o'clock till midnight. But the other, all the other moths were on some uh, wine ropes. So what I do is I get some cheap wine, including some of my um, homemade wine. I warm it up as if I'm making um, mulled wine, put a bag of sugar in it, and then I dunk some sisal or bits of rope um, in, in it. And then I hang that up along fences. And within half an hour, I'd got uh, those five moths on the sugar. So it's really interesting that, uh, and just shows that you don't have to be reliant on a moth trap. So as I say, this is a chestnut. It's quite a small moth. It's got, uh, it's quite squat. Um, it's quivering its wings, so it's a little bit blurred. But you'll see that it's got a little black dot uh, in in the centre of its um, uh, a, a kidney mark. My other moths are all going a bit wild here, but I have got one that I've trained very well. Uh, this is a red swordgrass, trying to become, trying to be a stick. It is actually alive. Um, despite it, uh, it playing dead, um, it, it has a cousin, um, the uh, swordgrass, which is much scarcer. This is very much a uh, moorland moth, an upland moth. You find it in, uh, it feeds as a caterpillar on a whole host of, uh, of different plants. Um, you tend to find the caterpillars in late summer. They're very, very big. One of the largest uh, caterpillars that uh, you would almost come across, 52 to 60 millimetres long, uh, bright sort of apple green with uh, a thin black and white stripes down, it, down its flanks. Um, this also, like my chestnut uh, uh, moth, it um, comes out in the autumn, so you can find it in September and October. It then uh, hibernates and then comes out in spring. Um, in uh, what February uh, on, on mild nights, but particularly March, April, sometimes uh, into May. Uh, so a wonderful um, imitation of a stick. You can even see at its head end that uh, it looks like a little twig where it's, uh, where it's broken off and you can see, see the pith inside. So uh, my other moth I was gonna try and show you was a satellite. Um, again, it also uh, hibernates. Um, comes out um, in, uh, initially in September, October, and then uh, hibernates as an adult, and then uh, comes back out uh, after hibernation early in the spring in March and April. So the, my three moths were all caught at sugar, and my two MV traps only caught two chestnuts. So it really shows you we don't have to be reliant on running moth traps to see um, and find moths. And with our talk about trying to be greener, um, you know, it's a lot greener uh, putting out sugar and wine ropes than it is running moth traps. Now, this is very much a double act. Um, the, the Chuckle Brothers, myself and Nigel. Uh, Nigel lives in Costa del Fife, right on the coast. And he always, always catches far, far more moths than I do. So um, I think that's it from me. And I'll hand over to my uh, beautiful assistant, Nigel. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Hopefully you can all see them off as well from me now. Yeah, looks good. Great, excellent. Um, right, uh, Tom started calling me his beautiful assistant. I have no idea why, it's, it's very inapt. Um, but anyway, thank you, Tom. Um, 
as you quite rightly say, um, plenty of moths on the wing um, in this part of the world. Last weekend, we had uh, four days of really nice warm spring sunshine from Saturday through to Tuesday, but the nights were quite cold. Um, Tuesday night uh, through to last night, we had much cloudier conditions, a um, little bit breezy at times, a little bit of rain around, but temperatures held up really well, particularly on Wednesday night, temperatures dropped only just below 10 degrees all night here. So lots of spring moth species um, have either emerged from hibernation or um, have pupated and um, appeared as adults. Um, I've got, I think, about 18 species here. I probably won't have time to get through all of them. Um, over the last four nights, I think I've trapped about 25 species in the garden, um, mostly using MV traps, um, but also using a uh, small LED light as well. Um, there's a few things that are kind of tying quite nicely with, uh, with climate change, actually, um, which I'll try and uh, point out as I go along. But anyway, let's get started. Um, there's a very well-known phrase, never work with animals and children. It's especially pertinent to geometers and micros. So uh, I've got quite a few of them. Hopefully they will all settle. This a mottled grey. I had the lid off for it two minutes ago and it just escaped. So I chased it around the room, got it back under control, but I don't think I'm just taking the lid off. So this is a mottled grey, a geometer moth. Um, it's a spring flying species which peaks from sort of end of March into uh, mid April. It's pretty widespread and common across most, uh, much of Scotland. Um, you can find it in damp woodlands, heathlands, where it feeds on bed straws. Um, it's quite similar to the early tooth stripe, which flies a little bit later. Um, subtle difference in the wing shape, which is a slightly larger species, early tooth stripes as well. Let's see if I can get the lid off so you can have a clearer look. We go so that is mottled grey. Um, I believe Anthony was going to put the names up um, in the chat box as we went along. Not sure if that's happening, um, but hopefully it is. So it's mottled grey. Yep, he's listing them for you. Great, thank you. I can't look at everything at once, so I've got to concentrate on the camera. Right, so this one coming up now is a water carpet, another geometer. Lovely moth that. Um, so this is very interesting from a climate perspective because um, it's a very, very early record. It's the earliest record I ever had in my garden, the earliest record ever in Fife here, um, and one of the earliest records ever in Scotland, in fact. Um, so uh, a good indicator of how um, the climate's warming, obviously, as, as Lisbeth was talking about earlier, um, uh, species emerging earlier. Um, so water, water carpet, quite a widespread common species. Um, right across Scotland. Um, the, the peak tends to be in uh, mid-May. Um, also comes in a dark form, this is the, the pattern form. Um, Bound woods, scrub, grassland, also feeds on bed straw like mottled grey. Next up, another very early emerging species. Again, earliest ever in my garden, earliest in Fife, and one of the earliest ever Scottish records. This is a shoulder stripe, another geometer, a lovely moth again. Um, also quite variable uh, in color, but uh, always has the same pattern. Um, typically you find these more in uh, mid to late April. Um, again, it's quite widespread in Scotland, but less so in the north and west and tends to be um, not found so much in the, the higher parts of the, of the country. Um, also typically found in woods, scrubland, open areas, and the larvae feed on rose bushes. Now, I was going to show you a marsh moth next, but at the moment it's going all over the place. So we will move on and skip that, and maybe come back. Um, this is an early grey next. And again, this is a relatively early record for this species, uh, usually more in April. Um, it is fairly widespread, um, but there are some strange gaps in its range in Scotland. Um, it's probably increasing though at the moment, um, typically found in woods and gardens, and it would largely feed on honeysuckle, um, both uh, native and um, cultivars. So that's early grey, that's a knock to it, um, uh, more robust um, moth than the geometers and mercifully they tend to stay much more still. Uh, 
Up next, we have a twin spotted Quaker. This is another pertinent moth to show when we talk about climate change, because this is a species which is expanding its range quite rapidly across Scotland. Um, it used to only be known in the, in the sort of the south of Scotland, but it's now quite widespread in the south and central um, and is appearing more and more so in northern Scotland as well. Um, quite a variable species in terms of ground colour. It typically has those two little black uh, dashes uh, towards the end of the wings, although they can be, um, in some forms, they can be reddish in colour and in some extreme forms they're altogether absent, which makes it um, more difficult to separate from clouded drab. Um, you find them in, mostly in woodlands, um, but also more open areas, scrubby areas and gardens. Um, they feed on oak, aspen, sallow, various other trees. But my next moth is a particularly special one for me. But unfortunately, it's just waking up, so let's see if we can get it shown before it decides to try and fly. This is an oak beauty. This is the first garden record for me, and also the first time I've seen it in five, um, which given I've seen over 800 species in five, um, it's unusual for me to get a new moth for my home county here. So oak beauty um, flies, um, or the peak of its flight season is late March and April. It's a pretty local species in Scotland, um, mostly found in central belt Perthshire, parts of Argyll and Dumfries and Galloway, favours woods and gardens, woods and gardens. Um, and although the name suggests it's an oak feeder, it actually feeds on a range of deciduous trees, not just oak. So that's a beautiful oak beauty, a large, robust, wonderfully patterned geometer moth. And next up is another oddity, something I've never seen in the garden before. This is a female dotted border. I get lots of males. The females are very unusual because they are apterous. They don't have wings, or in, in this case, it's a vestigial wing, very small, um, and they're flightless. I found this one on the house wall three nights ago, um, and it was very close to where I had a light shining, so whether it had been attracted to the light or not, I'm not sure. Um, but it's certainly the first time I've seen a female dotted border in the garden, and obviously indicates that they are breeding here. Um, flies mostly in February to March, quite widespread across Scotland. Um, the males are quite variable in colour, as are the females. In fact, this is a particularly dark individual. Um, they're found in woodlands, scrub gardens, and they feed on a range of deciduous trees. Right, I have a whole range of micros to show you, but I can see the time is ticking away. So let's see if I can get a couple anyway. Okay, you've got 10 minutes, Nigel. Have I? Oh, sorry, I thought I only had one minute, right? <laughs> oh, panic over, I'll calm down. Right, let's see what I can do. Oh, this one has moved nicely for me now. So this is a beautiful little micro. Clarus litterana, sometimes known as the mini Merve de Jour because it has a similar colour pattern to the um, noxuid uh, Merve de Jour, this kind of minty green, um, lichen coloured um, ground mass. They're quite variable, Clarus litterana. This is uh, one of the more sort of concolorous forms um, with uh, less bold markings, but it's a particularly beautiful form with more black markings. Um, this is a fairly unusual species for me in the garden. It's only the third record I've had here. Um, it's an oak feeder and as such tied very much to oak trees. Um, the nearest oak trees to my garden are probably about a mile away, apart from perhaps the odd ornamental one in the garden. So quite exactly where these moths come from, I'm not sure locally. They emerge in August to September as adults, then over winter and reappear in spring, March to May. Um, they're fairly widespread across Scotland, but quite localised um, to the oak woodland habitats that they require. Um, they're absent in the far north and west of Scotland, so it's the Clarus litterana. Um, which we'll try and do next. Let's try and show you this one. That's not 
too bad. Um, this is Rigognostus incarnatella. I said still, then maybe the light won't um, change too much. Rigognostus incarnatella. Uh, it's like a supersized diamondback moth, something that many of you might be familiar with. It can turn up in uh, tens of, well, tens of thousands, in millions um, in uh, plague years. It's a, a species which migrates from the continent. So this is Rigognostus annulatella, which is quite similar to the diamondback moth. Closely related, but this is not a migratory species, it's resident. Uh, it's quite localised in Scotland. Um, the population centres were around Speyside, Central Region and, and Forth, um, and also down, down Bruce and Galloway. It seems to be undergoing a massive uh, population increase at the moment. It used to be considered quite rare, um, but I now catch it quite frequently in my garden, maybe 20 to 25 a year, and I also see it uh, in other places in Fife too. Um, they emerge as adults um, in July onwards, oh, it's off, um, and then over winter, um, hibernate, uh, reappear in springtime, the first one I saw this year was in February, um, and they can carry on until April. Um, the larvae are not well known, but believed to feed on Danes violet, so it's Rigognostus incarnatella, a localised um, and interesting little micro. This one next. This is Dionia flagella. Um, fairly widespread and common throughout Scotland, except the far north and west. Um, that's largely because it's a sort of a woodland species and obviously there's not much habitat in that part of Scotland. Um, the larvae feed on various deciduous trees. It's a spring flying species appearing anytime from March through till May. Um, and in the north of England and Scotland, there's also a melanic form, that's a, a dark coloured form, um, which is not quite uh, uh, unicoloured, but um, uh, yeah, almost completely a sort of slaty grey, blackish colour. Dionia flagella. I've got four different Agonopteryx to show you here. Um, so Agonopteryx um, are, to some people's eyes, quite a similar species. Um, and people do sometimes shy away from them because they apparently can appear sort of quite difficult to identify. I just have to show this one through the, um, uh, the uh, container it's in just because of where it's decided to sit on the side there. Um, so this is Agonopteryx umbellana. Um, it is a gorse feeding species. Um, it's fairly widespread in Scotland, pretty localised and fairly scarce, um, mostly in coastal areas, but there are some in land records as well. It's not a species I see very often at all. I think this is only the fourth or fifth time I've ever seen it. Um, most of the times I have seen it happen in my garden here. Um, it emerges in August time, um, flies for a short while, uh, then overwinters uh, as an adult and reappears again in the springtime. And all of these four agonotric species I'm going to show you have a, a similar kind of strategy appearing uh, late summer, early autumn before overwintering as an adult and emerging again in spring. Um, Agonopteryx umbellana, this one is a um, relatively distinctive one with these um, quite dark longitudinal stripes all the way along the wings. Sharpen that up a little bit. That's looking very bright. That was Agonopteryx umbellana. The next one is Agonopteryx scopariella, which is a broom feeder. Um, again, fairly widespread across Scotland, but quite localised. Um, uh, the Speyside Moray area seems to be where the, the bulk of the records come from. Um, it's, um, it's quite a subtle moth to identify, but it's got a sort of smudgy black spot about halfway along the wing, next to that two white spots, um, and often a couple of little black spots which aren't particularly well developed. Just um, between the, the smudgy black spot and, and the head end of the moth. So that's Agonopteryx scopariella. Mm 
next one is Agonopteryx subprofinquella. You're probably going to think, oh, it's the same, same moth, it's just showing it again. But it is a little bit different. Um, slightly more pronounced um, black spot, uh, halfway along the wings with two black dots in front of it. Um, slightly more uniform, less patterned. And then it's got um, a dark, blackish sort of thorax and base of the wings. Um, Subprofen pillars are quite widespread across Scotland, but there's not that many records of it. It's quite localised, pretty scarce. Um, it feeds on that wing thistle, so it probably is overlooked to an extent because it's, its food plants are pretty widespread. Um, same as the previous two species, emerges as an adult in August time, flies for a short while before uh, hibernating and then reappearing in the spring. It's Agonopteryx subprofen quella. Going to jump around you know, and that's moving. I wanted to show you that one, but it's moving, so I can't do it. I'll show you something a little bit different looking if I can. It's in a horrible position in the corner of the box. Probably about as good as I can do. This is um, one of the plume moths, Amblyptilia acanthodactyla which is one of the most difficult species I find to actually spell. Yeah, that's probably a bit better, isn't it? So blue moths have got a very distinctive shape and resting position. They furl the wings together and then hold them out to the side of the body rather than pulling them over the, the body like most moths do. And they've got these very long legs with spurs coming off them. So um, has two generations, uh, one uh, in high, uh, so adult generations, this is one flies in July, uh, second one emerges in September time, flies for a short while before hibernating and emerging again in the spring. It's um, a pretty widespread species across much of Scotland and the larvae feed on a, a range of different flowers and leaves of uh, different species of plant. So it's Amblyptilia amphidactyla, sometimes known as the beautiful plume, which is a little bit easier to say. Um, See if the marsh moth is going to behave itself. Just uh, so this is marsh moth. I'll just jump back to the macros again here. Uh, this is another geometer. Um, as the name suggests, um, the peak uh, of its flight period is in March. Uh, it's pretty widespread in Scotland, except for the far north and west. Like the dotted border showed you earlier, the, fem uh, the females are wingless. It's only the males that have wings. Um, uh, in a wide variety of habitats, woodlands, scrub, open areas, gardens, and the larvae feed on a range of deciduous trees, including hawthorn and oak. I had wanted to show you Blastobasis vitata, which is um, uh, an inventive species um, uh, native to Madeira, um, but which is which I discovered here in, um, in Fife a few years ago and has now been found uh, across in Edinburgh and Lothian, and also was found in Glasgow this winter. Um, apparently it's just about going to behave itself. Um, it's a good example of you know, how climate's changed. This moth didn't arrive under its own steam, it would have been an accidental import as part of the horticultural trade most likely, but it seems very much at home here um, in the fourth region. Um, I record 200 plus a year in my garden now. Um, it's very similar to another inventive species of Blastobasis adastella, which is much more widespread. Um, they've got different flight times uh, in that this species flies throughout the year. It's a little bit smaller. Um, it's especially obvious in late autumn and early winter after Adastella has finished flying. So one to look out for as it spreads probably across Scotland, um, uh, but a difficult species. So if you do suspect you've caught one of these, contact your county recorder for a little bit more advice. But before I lose it, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Missed a couple of things. Um, thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Tiffany. Thank you, Tom and Nigel, our live moth correspondents. Uh, I enjoyed both Tom's Moths Gone Wild and Nigel's Very Behaved Specimens, uh, especially that stunning oak beauty. That was lovely. Um, lovely. 
Also, a great point from Tom about not needing expensive equipment. Just try not to drink all the wine at the weekend and save some for your garden moths and have a go at uh, doing some uh, ropes. So at this point in the programme, we should have had researcher Jessica Burrows talking about her PhD on fritillaries in Cumbria. Unfortunately, Jess has had to stand down due to some unforeseen circumstances, but our very own Patrick Cook has kindly offered to give a similar talk in her place. So we're sending our best wishes to Jessica, but welcoming Patrick's talk on marsh fertility monitoring. Okay, um, as Epiphany says, I'm going to talk to you about marsh fertility monitoring um, this morning and give you an update on how the project is going. So to begin with, I'm going to go through the ecology and the conservation of the species, why we need to monitor it, um, and then just to tell you what some of the progress that we've made um, working with volunteers and landowners on the ground. So just to begin with, the species has a distribution mainly focused on Argyle. So you can see these, each of these dots represents a record from 2000 to 2019. So throughout mainland Argyle, just reaches up into South Loch Arbor as well. And is found on the islands from Butte round to Isla to Mull, across to Tyree and up to Egg. We do have a, a population that's of national and international significance in Scotland. So it's really important that we monitor this population and understand how it's faring. In terms of life cycle, the butterfly is on the wing in May and June. Sometimes this extends into July if we get a particularly uh, poor spring. And it's one of our most beautiful species of butterfly, these really warm kind of contrasting orange tones. They lay their eggs in a batch on the underside of the food plant, which is devil's spit scabious, before the caterpillars then hatch in July and August. The caterpillars are of particular importance to monitoring. Um, we really focus our efforts on monitoring these larval webs uh, along with the adults, and it's something that I'll talk a bit more about later on. Initially, the caterpillars are a brownish color before changing color to this dark black color. Um, and they live communally in this web feeding on the food plant. They then overwinter deep down in a tussock, uh, really hardy things that can survive temporary inundation before emerging again in February and March the next year. They'll then pupate, forming this really interesting chrysalis before emerging as the adults again in May and June. Now, there has been some interesting research last year by Neil Ravenscroft that showed that this species in Scotland can overwinter more than once, um, which is really interesting that it has this two year life cycle. So as I mentioned, there's two ways to monitor the species. One is to go and count the adults. The other is to look at the larval webs. So this is a bit more of a close up view of what these caterpillars and webs look like. So in the top left here, you can see that we've got some early and star caterpillars that still have this brownish coloration to them. Whereas later on, they become more of this dark black color. Now, the reason for this is so that they can absorb the heat and energy from the sun uh, much easier. And this can allow them to collectively raise their body temperature by up to 20 plus degrees from the surrounding area. So a really clever adaption um, to living in a relatively cool climate. In terms of habitat, the species is one of these classic um, Goldilocks species. It doesn't like grassland that's too short, doesn't like grassland that's too long, but you'll find it in a range of habitats in Scotland. Um, so damp grassland, coastal grassland, and also moorland. But the key thing with any of these habitats is that there's an abundance of the food plant, which is devil's bit scabious. So that's this purplish blue flower that you can just see in front of it here. Now, this is a really important nectar source for a lot of species beyond butterflies and moths. So you'll see lots of hoverflies and bees on devil's bit scabious uh, later in the year as well. Now, as I mentioned, it is a bit of a Goldilocks species. And one way of maintaining habitat is by grazing through livestock. So by working with local farmers and giving advice, getting people into agri-environment schemes, we're able to maintain these conditions that the butterfly likes through low density grazing. 
There are some sites on the coast that are just maintained for exposure, so don't require uh, grazing at all as well. So it very much is site dependent um, and depends on the land history of the site as well. Now, as you can imagine, all of these factors influence the number of marsh tulip that you might find on a site year to year. But another important factor is that this species is what we call a classic metapopulation species. So when it's in a metapopulation, you can imagine that at the landscape scale, you've got lots of little patches of habitat um, and populations of the butterfly spread throughout. Now, this species goes through real boom and bust cycles. And you might find that at certain sites it goes extinct in one year and then recolonizes the next year. So it's a really classic example of needing habitat at a landscape scale that's relatively well connected. This boom and bust cycle can also be influenced by the weather in any one particular year, with the species responding really well when you have good conditions. It is also influenced by two species of sorry, uh, two species of parasitic wasps. Uh, one of which you can see in the right hand corner here. So there's lots of different interacting factors that can influence the population level of marsh artillery in any one year. So it's really important that we annually monitor the species to understand how it's faring, which can then inform the conservation work that we do on the ground. So as I mentioned, this monitoring data feeds into a sort of feedback loop between what grazing animals and their density decisions that a farmer can make based on advice from ourselves and partner organizations. Um, and the monitoring really informs um, and can drive those decisions that we make on the ground. But this is where we came across a problem uh, a few years ago in terms of monitoring the species in Scotland. So it might be a bit small on your screen, but on the right hand side, we've got a map here which showed all of the sites that have contributed data for marsh artillery either adults or for larval web scouts to the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. So this was taken from 2016, this map. Now you can see that most of these dots appear in England and Wales, and we have very few dots coming from Scotland. So this created two problems. One, we weren't able to generate a population trend for the Scottish uh, section of the species, which is really important given its national and international significance. But two, most of the sites came from a very limited area of Scotland. So monitoring undertaken by the RSPB on Isla and by Nature Scott at Tainish. So we weren't covering the full geographic range of the species, missing out important areas of mainland Argyle, Mole and other islands. So in order to tackle this, back in 2018 and 2019, Tom and David started running monitoring workshops in the field, which gave an opportunity to train volunteers on how to monitor the species. So it's relatively simple uh, monitoring wise, and we encourage monitoring of the larval webs, as I mentioned before. And it involves finding an area of suitable habitat, walking a transect in mid-August to mid-September, and counting the number of larval webs that you find. The advantage of this compared to looking for the adults is that it's much less weather dependent. So finding a good day in the spring can sometimes be difficult going out looking for adult uh, butterflies. But it also allows us to target that time of year when the devil's bit scabies is in flower, allowing you to easily find the suitable habitat, but also provides us information on where the species is breeding within that habitat as well. It's relatively time effective, so it only takes one to two hours per site and only needs to be done once a year. So just to show you some of the progress that's been made by working with local volunteers, this map shows all of the sites that were covered in 2020. So it excludes some sites that were covered historically and that have been discontinued for various different reasons and so on. So the blue dots have data prior to 2018. So you can see this previous bias that I mentioned, so sites from Isla and also Tainish. And then these yellow dots represent the sites that were set up in 2018 and 2019, working with volunteers. Obviously then 2020 happened uh, and we weren't able to get out in the field running training workshops um, to get volunteers up on sites uh, looking for marsh artillery. So we had to change our tack slightly and we moved online to Zoom like we are today. 
So we ran a series of online workshops, uh, training volunteers on how to find the species, looking for suitable sites. So one of the really great things about this is that we were able to look at maps with records, suggest sites that were very close and local to volunteers to go out and monitor. And we were able to have this impact on the ground. So you can see that these red dots represent all the new sites that were set up in 2020, which was absolutely incredible given everything that was going on um, at that time. The other really good thing about moving across to Zoom is that we were able to reach new audiences that we might not be able to meet in the field due to the difficulties of reaching these areas and the costs. So for instance, we now have monitoring set up on Tyree across Mull and on Butte as well. The network coverage continued to expand into 2021. So each of these red dots represents a location where we got monitoring counts from, largely conducted by volunteers. So we had further new sites on Mull and Isla. And we also had a number of new sites come to light that had long-term data from the mainland as well. So throughout this sort of review process, we found about four or five new sites and they're now contributing data to the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. And we're now up to 43 sites annually, which is really great progress um, and all thanks to these volunteers that are getting out. So each year we produce a monitoring newsletter, just as a bit of feedback, um, one to show that the data doesn't go into a, a black hole, um, but just to provide some graphics and so on. So for those of you that know me well, uh, you'll know that I really like doing maps to show things visually. Um, I don't know how well this will necessarily show up over Zoom, but this map shows each of the locations from 2021 where the species was monitored. And basically the larger the orange dot, the higher the number of larval webs that were counted at that site. So you can see that overall numbers were relatively good and pretty even um, across the whole of Scotland in 2021, much better than what they had been in 2020. So my next slide is showing the difference between 2020 and 2021. So in 2020, we had relatively poor numbers of marsh artillery. So as I mentioned before, they go through this real boom and bust cycle, and we think we were at that low ebb. So each, again, each of these dots represents a location where marsh artillery was monitored, and the colors of the dot represent the change between the two years. So the darker green color represents a bigger increase. Yellow, orange sort of represents relatively stable and red represents a decrease. Now, the thing I like about this map is you can begin to pick out trends of where the species has done well between different years or not. So for instance, some of these Western periphery sites saw a decrease, whereas in the mainland, we largely saw an increase. So it'll be interesting to see how this progresses over time and begin to understand both a site, a regional and a national level, how the population fluctuates through time. So a fantastic sort of change um, working with these volunteers to increase our, our coverage of the species. And we were actually able to produce the first Scottish trend for the butterfly last year. Now, worryingly, this trend showed a decline of 73% in abundance between 2006 and 2020. But as we get more sites into the network and longer term data from these new sites from the last few years, we'll be able to increase the robustness of this trend and it will help us make these management decisions. So it's been really good progress, um, but there's a lot more work still to do. You can see from the distribution map that I showed you earlier, there's still quite a few holes in the map. So this year we're going to be running more training workshops, both online and hopefully in the field as well to get volunteers out on the ground. Now, all of this data, as I mentioned before, is back into our conservation decisions and will help us inform future agroenvironment schemes, providing uh, the data, but also decisions that landowners can make on the ground. So just to finish off with, I just want to say a big thank you to all the volunteers that give up their time each year to go out and monitor the species. It's been a really fantastic effort and it's been really heartening um, just how interested people have been in getting involved in the project but also to the enthusiastic landowners who allow us access to go and do this. 
Um, there's plenty of opportunities to take part. So if, um, if you want to just contact me on my email, or if you look on the new volunteer opportunities page on our website, you'll find out how to get involved. And hopefully we'll see you at a workshop later in the year. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks so much for stepping in today with, with that great presentation. Really impressive. I think it just shows how powerful technology can be in helping us to communicate with people. Um, have we got any questions? Let's have a look. None are coming up just yet. I've got a question for you. Um, I am one of those people who hasn't made it over to, to see Marsh Fertillery for myself yet. Can you recommend the best place to go, maybe somewhere, the, the most accessible place uh, where I've got a good chance of seeing Marsh Fertillery? Um, so really, there's, there's lots of places. So if you want to go to one of the islands, Mull and Isla are really fantastic places. The butterfly is still relatively widespread. So one of my favourite points is actually on... Um, it's called Grass Point on Mull is a really lovely spot. You just got these fantastic views across the, the sound there, um, and you can see the butterfly there. In terms of on the mainland, the Ardfern Peninsula is a really great spot to see the species. Um, so really good and a bit more accessible because uh, you don't have to get any ferries and so on. So they would be my two recommendations. Um, also, Tainish is a good place to see them as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Also, in the comments here, are people saying sites near Oban, good places to go as well. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got a question from Jim saying, how do you rate the marsh fertility record in Dumfries area for 2021? I think it's a really interesting record. Um, where it originates from, whether it's an expansion from the Cumbrian population that was, that was reintroduced or whether it's, it's always existed there. I, I guess we'll never exactly know, um, but it'll be really interesting to see how that population progresses um, and, and see whether that continues to expand as well from that one site. Great, and a question from Wolf saying, you know if marsh fertility have been seen on the island of Lismore near Oban? So they are definitely on Lismore. We're hoping to get some monitoring um, conducted out there at some point. Um, so they, they do relatively well on Lismore. It's pretty good habitat um, for the species there. Excellent. And uh, one more question. Uh, we've talked about marsh fertility today, but for those of us who aren't lucky enough to, to live near the West Coast, uh, would you say just generally that fertilities are quite under-recorded and, and a good thing to focus on? Yep, so there's definitely um, some more species out there, so things like pearl border fertility, um, so that's what Jess was going to be talking about today, trying to encourage surveys and monitoring for them as well. Um, but also just any species that you can get out and monitor, so just a general transit, so Anthony is going to be talking about that that later on. It's all really valuable information and contributes to the cause. Excellent. Thank you very much, Patrick. So next up, we have master's graduate, Laura Penny, who's going to tell us about habitat preferences of slender Scotch burnet. Uh, I think this is the most enviable project title I've seen recently because Mull is my absolute favorite place to go in Scotland. And I, I understand that Laura actually lives there. So I can't wait to hear all about it. Over to you, Laura. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking about my master's project on the habitat preferences of the Sandra Scotch Manette Moth at the Glengorm Estate. So first up, just a little bit of information about the Sandra Scotch Manette um, so the subspecies is endemic to mole, which means it can't be found anywhere else in the world. And um, because of that, it's a UK biodiversity action plan priority species. Um, it does actually look really similar to the six foot bonnet, as well as quite a few other bonnets as well. Um, to tell apart, um, the slender scotch has spots five and six merged, as you can see here. Well, six foot has six clear spots usually. However, it is not always so easy. Sometimes skin to scotch can have big red blotchy patches that look nothing like the photo I'm showing you. So the easiest way I think to tell is the six spot has dark legs always, whereas the sand to scotch has kind of pale socks, which hopefully you can see. 
So always look out for the pale socks and also they're a little bit smaller, less metallic and quite fluffy as well. Um, so they inhabit mainly steep south or southwest facing slopes near the coast. Well, this, this is not always the case, um, but always they inhabit kind of herb rich habitat with quite short vegetation. Uh, the larvae feed on birds bit trefoil and they need bare ground actually to help their digestion. So they go and sunbathe on the bare ground to help digest that trefoil. Um, the females also feed on birds bit trefoil and the males tend to feed on purple plants such as thyme. So a little bit about the Glenglorm estate. Um, the Glenglorm estate is located just this blue star here and um, that's all other records of slender scotch bonnet on the map as well for you. Uh, the colonies were discovered in 2012 and um, there's quite a few coastal colonies as you can see from the records here but as I said there is some inland colonies as well. The land is sympathetically managed by the landowner so he grazes with native breeds such as highland cattle and black sheep and there's currently no monitoring at any of the, uh, the slender scotch brunette sites. sites. Um, so it's really important that we start to monitor these colonies. So the habitat at Glenglorm is very patchy, as you can see from these photos. Um, there's kind of big patches of suitable habitat, but there's a lot of problems with bracken encroachment as well, as you can kind of see. There's quite big areas of bracken and brambles are a problem as well. But it's a mixture of kind of like flatter meadow type areas and steeper slopes as well. So the aims of my project were to establish the overall habitat preferences of the moth. So essentially what habitat it likes and what it tries to avoid. But I also really wanted to investigate whether different behaviours had different habitat preferences as well. And lastly, I wanted to establish which colony supports the largest number of moths because this would make an ideal colony for monitoring. So to go about this, I selected three colonies for studies. So I picked Donara, which is probably the most typical habitat. It's got quite steep sided slopes there. Uh, Raven Laren is a little bit flatter, but it's also by the coast. And then Standing Stones is a little bit further inland, so it's kind of slightly less typical, I'd say. I selected 90 points, so 30 per site. Um, I quasi randomly selected these so that I could cover a spectrum of habitat suitability. Obviously, if I just picked all the same habitat, it wouldn't really tell us much about the preferences of the moth. I then carried out point counts at each of these 90 points. Um, so I looked for moths a radius of five meters around the central point for two minutes, and I recorded the behaviors that I saw, so resting, mating and nectaring. I repeated this six times during the flight season, so it was pretty exhausting, but it's definitely worth it. I then carried out vegetation surveys at each of my 90 points again. Um, I looked for plant species of interest to the moths, so for example, trefoil, but also plant species that can indicate certain habitat types. For example, moss indicates a damp habitat. Because uh, I surveyed quite a lot of different plant species, I had to condense my data. Uh, to do that, I used principal components analysis, which essentially arranges all my plant species onto axes and gives each plant a score. I selected the axes which explained the most variation and put these into models. And I created a model for the total number of moths and for each behaviour as well. So in terms of overall preferences, um, the total number of moths was positively associated, as you probably could have guessed, with trefoil, but also with thyme, which is, I said, like the male, uh, main male necked plant. And it was negatively associated with abundance of moss, tormental and grass. Uh, the arrangement of these plants on the axes can kind of tell us a bit more about the habitat as well. So these plants arranged together kind of represents quite a damp habitat, while travel and time prefer more drier habitat. So in general, the moths were preferring drier areas over the damper areas. Resting behaviour had the same overall preference as the total number of moths, but I was really excited to find that um, mating and nectaring had different habitat preferences. 
So both these behaviors were positively associated with the abundance of moss, truffle, and bellwether, and negatively associated with the abundance of woody shrubs and link heather. So this is quite interesting because um, obviously the overall preference was negative for moss. Um, so it's quite an important result. It shows that we really need to consider the needs of all these different behaviors because if we're just going by the overall preferences, we wouldn't be providing suitable habitat, for example, for a mating. Uh, one reason perhaps mating is occurring in a damper habitat is because the vegetation is likely to be longer and lusher. Uh, when moths are mating, it can last quite a long time and they're vulnerable to predators. So it's probably likely that they're just trying to shelter away from those predators and protect themselves. So next we'll talk a bit about the differences in moth number and vegetation between the colonies. Uh, this plot on the left here is just showing you the total number of moths that I recorded and the day along the bottom here. Uh, Danara is represented by the dark blue, sanding stones is mid blue and Ruben Lauren is the kind of lighter blue colour. Um, as you can see, Donara does support the largest number of moths, but there is a really interesting dip here. Um, I tried to record, obviously it's quite hard on well, the weather is not predictable, but I tried to record my accounts over kind of consecutive days of similar weather, and I tried to plan it so it was all on days of the same weather. Um, but obviously, like I can't record the ve weather very well, and the moths are extremely sensitive to temperature. So even though I had recorded the temperature and the kind of uh, weather as being the same, there might have been some really subtle differences that caused this kind of drop in numbers here. So I thought that was quite an interesting result. And this little graphic on the right here is also just explaining differences in the vegetation and number of moths. So these little stars are the total number of moths I caught in the mean number. So Donara had 12, mean number of 12, while Standing Stones and Reuben Lauren was only seven each. Um, the PC2 score here, um, that's from the axes that I explained, but essentially what that correlates to that is the abundance of trefoil and thyme. So we can see that Donara also supports a higher abundance of trefoil and thyme compared to both Standing Stones and Reuben Lauren. Um, even though the difference isn't that much because these are vital resources, perhaps just a slight decline in these plants um, is enough to cause kind of the reduced number of moths that Standing Stones and Reuben Lauren. Um, so what's the cons conservation implications of these results? So firstly, as I discussed, um, it really highlights the need to consider the requirements of different behaviours when you're planning conservation efforts. Obviously, you need to make sure that you're providing all the resources that the animal needs to kind of go about its daily life. Um, Apache habitat structure will really help to support these different behaviours. So having patches that are suitable for resting, suitable for nectaring and suitable for mating is very important. As well, Danara will make an ideal reference clay and hopefully species on the edge will be able to set up monitoring soon and we can use Donara for that. Also increasing the grazing at Standing Stones and Reuben Lauren. Uh, if you increase the grazing, it kind of reduces the height of the grass and it allows the other plants, which hopefully would be trifle in time, it will allow them to grow and hopefully then boost the numbers of the moth. And lastly, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Tom Mark, David and Chris for all their help with the project and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks Laura, um, it sounds like you had a really great time doing your field work, I'm very envious. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll all be booking our ferry tickets to Mull after the last two presentations to see these excellent species. Um, do I have any questions for Laura? Let me see. Uh, Clive says, do you know if there is any relationship with bracken cover? Um, bracken is definitely a problem for not just Gungoin, but <laughs> basically all the sites on the, like bracken is rampant everywhere. 
and obviously it's kind of shading out all the important plants to moths so definitely reducing the bracken would help boost the moth numbers as well I think and um, it's just quite hard to clear it because obviously when the moths are on these really steep slopes like you can't just go and cut it all down you can't mow it so it's quite hard to control that's why people are, are using spraying for it sometimes which not everyone agrees with but it's kind of the only way to get rid of it but yeah bracken is definitely a problem Sure. Um, I have a question from Ian uh, relating to your field work and he says, what height above the ground do you take the temperature? Uh, so I just recorded the temperature from my phone and, and like my project was just me doing it because of COVID and everything. So I just took temperature of the day because to, like I would have really liked to study my microclimate because that's kind of what's most important for the moth, I'd say. But just because of time constraints, I couldn't physically measure all of my 90 points, I'm afraid. So yeah, it was just a case of reading it from my phone on the day. But hopefully, sure. yeah, hopefully one day someone will be able to go and do full microclimate study for the slender scotch. Sure, I understand what it's like being out in, in the field doing, trying to do a million different things at once on your own and carry all of your equipment. <laughs> so uh, we've got people saying just impressive bit of field research and very clearly explained. So thank you for a good talk. Um, a comment from Nick saying Glen Gorham Estate is a fabulous place to visit and see slender scotch burnet and other burnets. Um, he went in mid July last year, but it was um, at slightly the wrong time. But thank you for an excellent talk, Laura. Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, unfortunately, Di Reed, head of uh, conservation, has also had to unexpectedly cancel today. He would have been coming in at this point to uh, say hello and to deliver an update on BC's new strategy. We're certainly entering a new phase of BC where things like engagement, improving diversity, tackling climate change, and of course, recovering threatened species of butterflies and moths are really at the heart of what we do. Our new 2026 strategy is essentially a roadmap which will help enable us to deliver on these goals. However, we absolutely recognise that we can't realise any of these ambitions without you. BC volunteers and branches are crucial to BC's work, and I'm really looking forward to working with you all on delivering the new strategy. Indeed, if you're a branch chair or a committee member, you've probably already noticed an increase in communications from us. We're working really hard to strengthen our relationship with branches and build trust. So there's certainly going to be a lot of exciting opportunities available uh, to volunteers in the near future. So stay tuned because you're certainly going to be hearing more from us regarding the strategy over the next year. I expect that Di will want to tell you more about it, perhaps at our autumn gathering. So I'll leave it there for now. And I'm going to hand over to our fabulous Anthony McCluskey, who would like you to take on a transect. So you might have heard a talk similar to this last year, Take on a Transect in 2021. And I'm pleased to say that a lot of you did get in touch with me about taking on transects. And this is a really important part of our work. As we've seen today, so much of our data comes from volunteers collecting this information. So I want to encourage some of you to take on a transect this year. Just to say that my work is through the Help Enhance for Butterflies project, which is supported by Nature Scott and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And one of our biggest reports was the State of UK Butterflies 2015, and that used over two and a half thousand uh, transect records, as well as looking at the wider countryside butterfly survey locations and lots of other casual records. And some of the really interesting information about this came out in 2020. And just next week or the week after, we are about to publish the 2021 results. But just so you can see how this information is put into use. And this is the results for Scotland. And if you just look at something like the orange tip, for example, the series trend, which goes over 22 years, showed that orange tips have increased fourfold in 22 years of monitoring in Scotland. Most of the rest of the white butterflies have increased too, but things like green veined white have stayed roughly the same. This is very often at odds with 
uh, data we're getting from England and Wales, where many of these species are decreasing. So it shows that there is a north-south divide in many of these records. And it might also indicate that white butterflies are of less conservation concern for us, at least in Scotland. But then if you look at some of the brown butterflies, you can see different trends as well. For example, the wall butterfly has increased sixfold in 22 years of monitoring. So you can see that circled there by over 600%. Speckled wood, small heath and ringlet are also on the rise. And in fact, small heath had its best year in 42 years of recording in 2020. So you can see that um, small heath seems to be doing quite well in Scotland, but doing very poorly down south. But then what's really concerning is that things like the grayling are decreasing very rapidly. The graylings have fallen by 90% in 31 years of monitoring. Now, unlike with the increases, with the decreases, they can only go to minus 100. So at minus 100, they will be completely extinct. So whaling populations in Scotland now are 10% of what they were 30 years ago. So, that, uh, so this shows that monitoring is vital for us because it's an early warning system about species we need to take more con uh, concern about. Now, just to show you that all your records are important. So if you do something like casual recording through the I Record Butterflies app, where you're sending spreadsheets and things to recorders, those are really important, but we need monitoring as well, as we, we've seen the value of monitoring in all of the presentations today. These transects include the UK BMS, the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and the wider Countryside Butterfly Survey. So the UK BMS is a weekly butterfly count along a fixed route during suitable weather. There are all species transects, which run from the 1st of April every year until the 30th of September, taking in a whole 26 weeks. And then there are single species transects, which are only throughout the flight period of target species, such as small blue, northern brown argus, or grayling. Those often last one to two months or so. And in case you haven't done a transect before, um, for existing transects, you'll be given a clear map with clear directions on it. We'll have a start and finish point with all the sections laid out. And you just have to record all the butterflies you see in each section. You're also recording environmental data like the temperature and sunniness. And most transects are served by small groups of two or three people, or you can just do it individually. So it shows that you don't have to take on all the effort yourself. I just want to give an example of some of the volunteers who've came on to butterfly monitoring in the last year or so. And I'm so impressed by the, uh, by the level of just go that some of our volunteers have. You know, they're able to take a task and really run with it. And they're showing a lot of initiative. So two of the volunteers were Marion and Janet. They attended my online workshops in March last year. They found that there were no transects near them, but they wanted to set up one at Pit, Pit Body Den, which is a place where they often walk. Uh, and this is a place near between, uh, between Perth and Dundee. So you can see the satellite map there, and you can see the transect they helped them set up. It had five sections in it. So we did this through Zoom. And this is one of the great advantages to doing stuff through Zoom. They did such a good job. They conducted 23 surveys last summer out of a possible 26 week period. And they found 18 species on the site, including northern brown argus and small pearl border fritillary, which are two of our priority species. And I very much hope that they'll be continuing that this year. But I just want to illustrate to you all that if you're not doing a transect already, that you can hopefully take part in one and we will do everything we can to allow that to happen. So uh, new transects are useful everywhere. We need to know what's happening to our widespread species. So it's not all about our priority species. We still need to know what's happening to um, small tortoiseshell and peacock because those are changing rapidly. These can act as an early warning system for declines of widespread species, as well as being really important for our priority species too. But here's a selection of some of the transects we'd like to some help with. And I'll start off by Northern Brown Argus. We do need transects for the species everywhere, but especially in the borders. There are single, uh, this would involve a single species transect, which really would only need to run between June and early August. So that's about eight weeks. Monitoring this butterfly going back during this time um, to record the butterfly at certain sites. If you shared the transect with only one other person, that's only four weeks of recording each. So you can contact us to express interest and we'll match you with the Northern Brown Argus site nearby. So many of the Northern Brown Argus transects aren't mapped yet, but if you tell us where you, where you are and where you'd be willing to go, we'll match you with one nearby. So do keep that in mind. And there's maybe forest. So this is, uh, it's managed by Forestry and Land Scotland, but it's one of Butterfly Conservation's three reserves in Scotland. It's home to three of our priority species, including the pearl border fertility, small pearl bordered, and the forester moth. 
So um, it's a really nice mixed woodland site. Um, and it's one of our longest monitored sites as well. Now, this used to be monitored through contracts and contractors and things, but we do need more volunteers to get involved in this um, and there'll be a road system. So um, if you're close to Dumfries, especially, um, you might want to get involved in maybe forest. Um, we need a few more volunteers to help and there will be a road system in place so you won't be expected to do it every week. And there will be training to help you separate those fertilities. I know it can be tricky, but once you get your eye in, it becomes much simpler to separate those two fertility species. So hopefully you want to get involved in that. And there's the Limping. It's a site very close to where I am today. This is owned by Sterling Council um, and it's just near Sterling. And calling it a former spoil heap from coal mining doesn't really sell it that much, but it's excellent for butterflies. And I want to show you what you can see on a typical day there in the summer. You can see hundreds, literally hundreds of six bulb burnout moths. And I conducted the transect once and I recorded 99 common blue butterflies on the transect alone there in the summer. So it's a very good site for species like this, which need the birds with trefoil and other wildflowers found there. So it's been monitored for a few years by volunteers, but we need more help with that. So if you want to get involved in the transect at Phil and Bing, do let me know and that will be an all season transect. But coming on to the grayling, it's a favourite species of mine, a really beautiful species. You can find it in the heart of Edinburgh at Calton Hill and at Holyrood Park, where we have single species transects running. So it's quite well monitored in the east of the country, but there is no monitoring at all of the grayling in the west of Scotland. So not a single transect. So if you're in the west, um, if you're on any of the islands or if you're around Oban or anywhere where you see any of these coloured dots, do get in touch to let us know because we'd love to set up a grayling transect. They only need monitor between late June and around mid-August, and there are really fantastic species to get involved in. And I think it's just shocking that we have no monitoring for that species in the West, because all our data for Scotland is coming from the East, and we really need to remedy that. So hopefully we can do that this year. Um, and then there's a transect in Haddington. So this was set up a few years ago by one of our volunteers there, Nick. Um, uh, he moved away in 2019, but it was monitored for nine years before that. It has 15 butterfly species there, including the wall, wall brown and the small skipper, possibly has large skipper by now as well. So it's just to show that in little um, kind of urban places like this, there are transects all over the place that we want to help match you up with. So um, if you're near Haddington, it'd be fantastic if you could get involved in that one. And then in error, I helped to set up a transect there a couple of years ago with a volunteer called Anna. Um, there's a new transect just in error itself along the Seafield Dunes but also in Belle Isle Park, which is holly blue. So it's one of the few transects in Scotland with holly blue on it. So again, if you're in error, let me know and I'll get you hooked up with Anna. Um, and just to say that our, that our UK BMS website is much better than it used to be now. So if you look, there is a, it's a basically the website and then forward slash sites, you can see a map of all the transects in Scotland. So the more you zoom in, the more accurate location you'll be shown. So if I zoom in in Glasgow here, you can see all of the transects around Glasgow. So if I click on this one at um, Rob Royston Local Nature Reserve, it tells you when it was first surveyed, when it was last surveyed, and how many surveys have been done. So if you were to click on a site like that and you see, would see that it hadn't been surveyed since say 2019 or 2020, that would be a good indication that it needs new transect walkers. But even if it was walked last year, you might want to get in touch with us anyway, because that might be a, a site which was only surveyed a handful of times last year. So we can get you in touch with the person currently walking it. And hopefully between you both, you'll get close to 26, 26 weeks of monitoring at it. Another example here, Kelvin Grove Park, you can see it was set up in 2012 last surveyed in 2012. So it was only surveyed for one year, only 11 surveys done. That might be because it wasn't very good for butterflies, but we could have a good look at it and maybe get that one set up again. But we can also help you set up new transects around the city or anywhere that you're at. Just to come on, before I finish, I want to come on to a couple of new surveys coming um, on board. The Garden Butterfly Survey has been running for quite a while, but the website was re recently relaunched and it's much, much easier to get involved now. So if you haven't done the Garden Butterfly Survey before, it only takes one count per month. And it's um, a really great way to see how those more widespread species are doing. So definitely have a look at the new website. And also want to say that the, new, the iRecord Butterflies app is much better now as well. So it was relaunched last year. Um, it looks much better. There's a lot more information in it now. You can do a lot more with it. Um, and if you have a look at it today, you might also see some differences. So we've added some day flying moths, which are really fascinating to have a look at. So we've added uh, a few dozen species of moth in it. You can also undertake what's called a timed count. 
So if you were at a site with a rare species like Northern Brown Argus, you could undertake a timed count where basically every time you push the button on the screen, it takes a, a, a record of that species. So you could be walking through a site and every single time you see a Northern Brown Argus, press the button and it makes a record. That gives us a really great way of seeing exactly where these species are found. Just to say though, that that version will be released to everybody within coming months. But if you sign up as a beta tester on, um, on the App Store or through a Play Store, you will be given access to this early version of the app with more features on it. So you can have a look there. That's free to download and you can search for I Record Butterflies wherever you get apps. Um, and just to say, I'm running some training soon. So transects are suitable for beginners and those with more experience. I'm running lots of workshops this month, supported by the National Lottery and by Nature Scott. So in March, all of my workshops are on the, these are the dates here. So Saturday 19th, Sunday 20th, Wednesday 23rd, Sunday 27th, and Thursday the 31st. These are all online through Zoom. They last from 10 a.m. till noon, and you can register through the address here, but we will be sending a link out to everybody who attends today. So you will get a copy of that link and you can pick on to some of the workshops and hopefully I'll see some of you there. That will cover butterfly ID and how to monitor them through uh, Transect. So hopefully some of you are interested in that and you want to get more involved. So that's me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I can take any questions. Great. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, it's always great to hear what our volunteers have been up to. Uh, I'd like to fly my flag for a grayling because that's my, my favorite butterfly. And I'd also like to add that no matter what your skill set is, if you would like to volunteer for BC, please do get in touch with Anthony because we're always looking for new people. And this might be a field based role like like transect, but it could be engagement or admin related. So please do get in touch. Um, there are a few comments in the chat box, a couple of people um, asking for help with their transects, so do check them out and see if they're, they're near, near you. Uh, Demasher saying the recently established Carrick transect picks up Grayling in southwest Scotland, so that's great news. Um, let's check out the Q&A box. Uh, Sarah is talking about um, how you manage a transect if you are going to go on a holiday, but this is something you can help with, isn't it? Anthony, you can, we can help manage that. Yeah, yeah, that is. And actually, and just an example for that, Sarah, is um, we have had a few instances that way where volunteers get in touch to say, to really ask for more help. And then I can get in touch with other volunteers because I know where they're based and I can put out a call to them. So that is very possible. So do do let us know. Do reach out to us. Don't just, don't just not do the transact because we can help. Great. There you have it. No excuse if you're going on holiday. Uh, David says, do you share data with the Garden Bird Survey, BTO? Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the other way around, really, because so the BTO survey called the, the Garden Bird Survey or the Garden Wildlife Survey um, also allows you to record butterflies through that. And we do get that data, so it does come to us. So if you send in data there, it does come to our recorders. Excellent. And I think that is everything. Um, so thank you very much, Anthony. Um, that was a, a great presentation. And finally, uh, we must be nearing the end because it's Tom Prescott here to tell you how you can help butterflies and moths this year. So what I want to do for the next uh, 20 minutes is send you all away with something that you can do. So that I'm gonna go through probably quite rapidly a number of activities where we're seeking volunteers to help. Um, some of it may be practical work where you can go out and uh, keep fit and get mucky and uh, do some uh, with our work parties. Others might be more uh, helping with some of our survey work. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so let's start. So one of the, the, the really exciting projects that we've run for the last eight years is our Bog Squad project. Uh, uh, we welcome Polly back. Um, she started again in January. And uh, the main aim of this project is to run uh, work parties. We are using local volunteers to improve some of these uh, low, uh, lowland raised bogs, uh, primarily in the central belt, but also uh, elsewhere. So this was Polly's first work party um, back from, uh, from, from being away for a wee while. And this was actually the, the 100th Bog Squad work party. I mean, that's amazing that there's been, that, this, that we've had 100 of these work parties. Um, Polly is with us under Bog Squad until March 2024. 
And in that time, she's got 60 uh, work parties to run. She's already run, run a number since January. And here are some of the others that are due, that she's already organized uh, in March and April. Um, so you can see there, bottom left, it, it involves clearing scrub. Here, with the, the volunteers are using the wonderful tree poppers to pop uh, birch out of the ground. And you can see the mussels there on Anthony on the right as these banging in, um, piling to try and retain the water on site to make the, these bogs wetter. Um, so we've got uh, activities there in, in Ayrshire, in Dumfries, and around Loch Leven. So um, please come along and, and help at these, the, these events. They're always really, really good fun. Um, and you're also keeping fit at the same time and meeting like-minded people. So it's really good that we can get out and about now and actually do some good and, uh, and meet up with people. And all these events start at 10 and finish at three. Another thing that uh, Polly is uh, doing as part of her uh, bog, part of the Bog Squad project is to organise a large heath survey. Now, this is over two years. Um, I think I probably showed uh, at almost an identical slide last year because we were hoping that we could start this survey last year. But unfortunately, our funding for Bog Squad didn't come through until the end of the year. So we weren't able to run it. But we're now on track. Um, so Large Heath is a very is a, a bog specialist. The caterpillars feed on um, cotton grass. Um, it's a butterfly that looks a little bit different where you are in Scotland, down in the south here. You can see it has these lovely um, dark rings and with white spots, whereas further north, um, it, it, those uh, dots are very much reduced and sometimes can be absent. So that this map here gives you a sort of indication of some of the lowland sites uh, that we would like you to, uh, to record, to see how large heath it is doing. Is it still at at these sites. Um, hopefully we may also provide uh, maps of where large heath is in the highlands and in some of the more upland areas so that this can then become more of a sort of national survey over the two years. Now on to uh, Pearl Border Fritillary. Um, because Jess was unable, sadly unable to, to make it today, um, you're left with me. Um, to tell you a little bit about Pearl Border Fertility and what we would like you to do. So this is a, a priority butterfly. It is uh, fairly scarce and, and certainly threatened in the UK and particularly in uh, down south, but also in Scotland. Um, it's a spring butterfly. It's on the wing uh, in an early year with us at the end of April, but certainly to me, I really think of it as a sort of middle of May to middle of June species. A really, really wonderful, uh, colorful butterfly. This is where it's recorded. Uh, the red and colored dots are where it was recorded between 2010 and 2014, but anything in blue was where it was uh, recorded before that, but not in that time period. And if you look at that, you can see immediately how uh, many sort of yeah, uh, blue circles or blue crosses uh, are coming through on the map. Now, some of these must almost certainly be genuine declines where, where the butterfly has probably gone extinct, but because of its habitat and it's quite remote and it's an early spring season uh, species, it is quite easy to miss uh, pearl bordered fritillary. Um, you've really got to go and target where to, to look and at the right time of year. So what we're trying to do is to um, encourage people to go out and so that we have a far better picture of how pearl bordered fritillary is in terms of its distribution in Scotland. So we're going to run a national survey. Um, there'll be details eventually online. But the other issue that we have, in, particularly in Scotland, is, is identification because there is the cousin of the pearl bordered fritillary, the small pearl bordered fritillary. And despite the name, the small pearl bordered fritillary isn't necessarily smaller than the pearl bordered fritillary. Um, in general terms, female butterflies are usually bigger than the males because they have the eggs, or their bodies are a bit bigger, a bit heavier, therefore they have slightly bigger wings to keep them afloat. 
And therefore, on average, a female small pearl border fritillary is probably bigger than a male pearl border fritillary. Small pearls are pretty scarce down south. We know certainly down in the southeast, they've almost become extinct. But they're luckily for us, because we still have these wonderful landscapes of semi-natural habitat, small pearl border fritillary is uh, still fairly widespread, and I would say certainly in the Highlands and Argyll, a common butterfly. So if we want you to go out and look for pearl border fritillary, we have to ensure that uh, you can identify them and tell the difference between pearl and small pearl. Small pearls are more common in Scotland because they prefer a, a damper habitat. Their caterpillars tend to feed on marsh violets. So you find them in, in woodland rides, you find them uh, out on open moorland, in glades, you know, any sort of dampish habitat where there's um, marsh violet. And you can see from the distribution map on the right just how widespread it is in, in most of Scotland, although it's very scarce in the borders. But also you can see uh, for England, central and southeast England, how it has sort of completely disappeared. So in terms of trying to identify the two, we have both species there. It, is, it can be very subtle, particularly um, on the upper side of the wings. But if you look at the, at the right hand butterfly, the small pearl bordered fritillary, it has conveniently got a lovely number on it. You can see here 730, um, which I don't know what you'd say the number is on the pearl bordered fritillary on the left, squiggle squiggle zero perhaps. Um, Another feature are these chevrons that are around the uh, tips of the wings. And you'll see on the right, the small pearl border fritillary, those chevrons are uh, connected to the dark border. Whereas on the pearl border fritillary on the left, they're floating. They're not quite attached to the, uh, to the darker boundary. Another feature that I use that, that can be difficult in the field, but can be fine on photographs, is this little dot here. If you see these uh, markings uh, that make up this wiggly band, if you look at the one that's nearest the edge of the wing, and then look in this rectangular cell here, you'll see that that dot is more or less in the centre of that rectangle. That's for pearl board fritillary, but if you see here, that same rectangle using that same smudge that, that's on the nearer the tip of the wing, um, that dot is not in the center. It's not here, it's towards the edge of the wing. And that is quite a good feature from uh, photographs. It's far easier to identify them by looking at the undersides. Now that can be very difficult to see in the field. That's why I, I always recommend people take a butterfly net with them but the, the differences are easier. So one difference is that there's a small dot in this cell on pearl bordered and a bigger dot on small pearl. There's only a couple of white cells in amongst all these sort of magnolia colored ones on the underside in the, in the center of the wing. Whereas in small pearl, there's what, four, five, six, and the boundary of the cells are, are a much thicker blacker line. And finally, there's the chevrons that border the, the white pearls um, are tend to be black in small pearl and tend to be brown in uh, pearl. So there are a few subtle differences. Um, the, the issue is, is that there's an overlap in their flight period. So pearl border fritillary tends to be on the wing uh, beginning of May uh, through till the middle of June whereas small pearl is on the wing end of May and through June into early July. So you have that period sort of uh, last few days of May and June where you could have both. And phew, uh, there we go. There's confirmation that I got it right. Now, in terms of habitat for pearl border fertility, this is their sort of heaven. So you've got a very steep south facing sheltered slope, a really, really warm microclimate. Um, more than that, you have bluebells here, you have uh, bugle here, so you have lots of nectar. Um, but what's really, really important is having dog violets. But more than that, these dog violets are growing in amongst a sparse litter of bracken. Um, and it, that provides an even warmer microclimate. And that is so important for the caterpillars 
which are black and they sun themselves and sunbathe at this time of year on that dead bracken. They bring their body temperatures up so they can then become active and move and feed and digest their food. So it's really, really important that they have this really, really warm microclimate. So that that so you've really got to be a detective when you're out looking for something like pearl bordered fertility. So be aware of, of this habitat, and um, then go out in the middle of May through till um, what the, the middle of June, and be aware of how to identify them and the difference between pearl and small pearl. And a site like this along the bottom where it'll be a little bit damper or there might be the odd burn coming down, you'll have marsh violets and therefore you often and regularly get both species at the same site. So the key things are south facing, ideally somewhere that's nice and sheltered, you need that lovely mosaic of bracken and violets. And in many, many sites, you might hop over the fence or you climb up a steep hill and you're in amongst the bracken, but the bracken litter is so thick that there's the, the poor violets just can't get through. And therefore with no violets, you're not gonna have any pearl bordered fritillaries. But we have Jess um, with us. She is a PhD student. She's taking a sort of three month sabbatical and coming to join us starting at the end of March. She did her MSc on pearl bordered fritillary in Cumbria. And we are going to use her skills to try and find out more about the butterfly in Scotland, but she will be running training days along with perhaps myself and my colleague, David. Um, and we will uh, be getting you out into the field. And she's specifically gonna be looking at the egg laying sites, these really warm microclimates where the, the females are laying her eggs. So I think that's pearl bordered fertility in terms of its habitat. And this map here shows you the uh, more recent records of the butterfly from 2010 to 2019, overlaid over the older records from 1990 to 2010. So anything that's there in sort of uh, pinky red, but not with blue on top, shows you a site where the butterfly hasn't been recorded since 2010. So there's a lot of orangey red on that map. Um, so lots of sites where we really don't know whether the butterfly is still there or not. So if we zoom into some of these areas where there's been no record since 2010, um, so there's places like Glen Affric, you know, the butterfly, it's amazing that pearl bordered fertility has not been seen at Glen Affric since 2010. Um, so we've got Fort Augustus and, and between there and Fort William, again, a number of areas where particularly south of Fort William, where the butterfly has not been seen since 2010. So we're going to try and encourage you to go to some of these sites where we put in maps uh, on our website um, so that you can get involved and you can see the, the particular areas and the particular sites and locations that we'd like you to target. Another area where there's a sort of a dearth of recent records. Um, it's certainly well known, just uh, uh, west of Pitlochry, um, but there's a number of records around, older records around, particularly around Aberfeldy and also Dunkeld, where the butterfly hasn't been seen for a number of years. So plenty of sites there, there to, to go for. Now, um, a little bit about another project, uh, Cairngorms uh, Connect. Um, this is a 200 year project, a restoration project with four landowners trying to restore habitats over 600 square kilometers. So it's, it's, a, it's a vast area, it's a vast project. Um, you can see there where it is in the center of the Cairngorms. Um, and I've been working very closely with their project scientists because they've been using moths as one of the indicator species to determine how the restoration is going. So for the last couple of years and for the next three years, they're wanting to collect more baseline data across that area. But what they're now trying to do is they want some control sites. They want to compare how the moths are doing within the Cairngorm Connect area compared to how they're doing outside the Cairngorm Connect area. So they're trying to push people to look at these particular locations in the east of the Cairngorms, um, around Braemar, um, and what can be better than to go out to, into this really lovely landscape uh, with a heath trap in June and July, 
and look for some of our sort of montane species. So you might have be lucky enough to pick up something like Northern Dart, this lovely montane species that's shown in the, in the top left. So they have eight locations um, uh, away from the Cairngorm Connect area where there are these uh, sites that they're going to use as control. Uh, ideally, they'd also like you to monitor the birds and the plants. So if you have bird knowledge and plant knowledge as well, that would be even more useful. So just get in touch if you want to get involved with, uh, with Cairngorm Connect, either at these um, sites here shown on the map or at the, the, within the, the big red uh, polygon that I showed before. We're trying to step up our work on dark-bordered beauty. This is a very threatened species. It only occurs at three sites in Scotland, uh, three populations and uh, one in the north of England. In Scotland, it's associated with aspen, with young aspen suckers, probably up to a metre, one and a half metres tall. Uh, there's a difference between the male and the female. We have the female here on the right, the male on the left. And we've put in a bid for Nature Scots Nature Restoration Fund. We've got past the expression of interest phase and we're very hopeful that our application will be successful. And over the next two years, we are hoping to manage maybe eight sites to improve those sites for this particular mock. Some of that will be through deploying contractors, putting up little fenced exclosures to reduce the grazing that will then allow the aspen suckers to, uh, to spread and to become much denser. But also we're proposing to try and link up some of these aspen stands, either by protecting existing aspen, by putting um, tubes or little wire cages around them, but also by planting up aspen to try and fill in the gaps with the, the current very fragmented aspen woodland. So that's something else that you can uh, get involved with. Now, nor northern brown argus, back to a butterfly. Um, Barry Prater and the volunteers in the borders have been doing an absolutely amazing job uh, by re revisiting former sites for this butterfly over the last, what, five years. And you can see there that they visited over 158 sites and 91% of the sites in the borders have been visited over that five years. Um, so they've really now got a far better handle on how the butterfly is faring at these sites throughout the borders. But they've also been assessing the condition of those sites, not all of them, but the vast majority of them. And you'll see there that 72 of them, 50% of them, have deemed to be unwrapped. And that has allowed us to identify sites where we can go in and do some habitat management work. So uh, I ran a couple of work parties at this particular site at Laidlaw Steel near Clovenfords, clearing scrub under a way leaf. And we're hoping again through Nature Recovery Fund to undertake further work with contractors at four sites. This is, will be one of them, we'll go and clear further scrub, but, but also some adjacent sites. And again, there's probably an opportunity for people to get involved and help with that work. And also we need to ensure that the areas that we've already cleared remain clear. We don't just want to turn our backs and let the scrub return. Also through this data, we were able to make a very strong case to uh, Scottish Borders Council and to Scottish Forestry about the plight of uh, Northern Brown Argus. A number of the sites that are either scrubbing up or they're being lost to afforestation as trees are planted. So through uh, the borderlands, we have a project that we're hoping to start uh, later in the year we're at the development phase at the moment. It's a, uh, which has been funded by the South of Scotland Enterprise and by Scottish Borders Council. And we're trying to work with uh, farmers. It's, this is a natural capital project. And the idea is to try and work with farmers to ensure that the, the current grazing regimes are suitable and to try and ensure that they have uh, economically um, paid for their grazing of, uh, of these sites. Um, in 2024, we're hoping that there will be a new agri-environment scheme 
and that the work that we do under this project will help um, help design that scheme. So it's working for species rich grassland, but particularly for us, it's working for Northern Brown Argus. But we're also keen to roll out a national survey and really blueprint what Harry and all the wonderful volunteers have done in the borders elsewhere in Scotland. Now we have our species on the edge project and we're hoping that we will get the green light for that. We will know in um, hopefully in June whether that goes ahead or not. And if that's the case, then those locations um, with the blue circles around them will be covered by species on the edge. The black circle in the borders is already covered through, through Barry and his volunteers, as are the other two black circles in the Sidlaws and in Fife, because we have found other Barrys in those areas to undertake this work and to coordinate um, surveys. But we're still looking for people to take on these orange lozenges. Um, so we have volunteers actually already for East Lothian and the Ockles, but we're looking for people to help um, oversee surveys to target people to survey Northern Brown Argus in South Ayrshire, Perthshire, the Angus Glens, Deeside, the North Cairngorms and baden Ock and Strathspey. So um, if you're in those areas and you want to help either with the surveys or to help coordinate the surveys, then please just get in touch. And the great thing about Northern Brown Argus is that you've got a long period when you can record it. The caterpillars feed on rock rose. So it, it, when it's in flower, it's very, very obvious plant are growing in amongst this wonderful species rich grassland. Um, but you can also go out uh, where, and look for the eggs. You can see here the single eggs, they look like mini fun sized golf balls, usually laid singly on the top of the leaves of rock rose. Occasionally the butterfly isn't, hasn't read the book and you'll get two eggs laid on the same leaf. Um, but you can also, once the egg has hatched, the caterpillar comes out of the egg by uh, eating its way out of the egg and it therefore leaves a wee crater behind, which will also stay on the, on the leaf. And therefore you can go out and look for these wee polos. So you have a long amount of time, you probably have from June through to what the end of August to go out and either look for the butterfly or to look for the eggs, either unhatched ones or hatched ones. So you've got a long period of time to look. And of course, looking for the eggs, it, you can do it in any weather. So you can't even use that as an excuse. And these are these are some examples of some of the maps that were produced for the for the borders surveys. They were prioritised in terms of when the last records were, whether the, how suitable the terrain was, whether there were rock rose records from these sites, but no butterfly records. So this is what we envisage um, rolling out across the rest of Scotland for Northern Brown Argus. Now back to a moth, the Portland moth. One of the, uh, well, the first goal of uh, Butterfly Conservation's new uh, corporate strategy is to halve the number of threatened species. And um, so that is 65 species that uh, yeah, over by 2026, uh, we would have reduced the threat to them. There's a provisional list of 71 species that uh, has now been produced and Portland moth is on that list. There's 24 species in Scotland that are on the current provisional list that we will then be working on. Um, but Portland moth is on there and you can see why at a UK level, um, how it has declined. You, this is taken from the uh, larger, the Atlas of Larger Moths, the black dots of where the, the moth was recorded post 2000, the yellow and the blue dots where there were former records. And you can see how many, how many colored dots there are compared to how many small black dots. So this species really, really is under, under threat. Um, it's very, very coastal. Uh, we have quite a high proportion of the population in Scotland. Um, and it, it's a lovely, it's a large, lovely greeny brown moth uh, associated primarily with sand dunes. There are also record, old records from the Spey where it's feeding, where it's found on the, the, the lovely sort of shingles and the, and the sandy um, islands in, in the Spey. And that the key thing for this uh, moth is that the caterpillars feed primarily on creeping willow. 
but it's feeding where that creeping willow is in a sandy substrate because during the day the caterpillars burrow down into the sand and hide away and then they come out at night and feed on creeping willow. They also feed on other plants, uh, things like bird's foot trefoil um, and mouse ear. Um, the adults are strongly attracted to light, although they tend to hop into a light trap. You don't necessarily need to go out at night with a trap. You can go out with your torch because you'll find them feeding on uh, heather, on the flowers of heather, on ragwort. You can go out with your sugar and your wine ropes and find them. Or you can look for these caterpillars during the day because when they burrow down into the uh, ground, they, they sort of leave behind a, a mini little sort of sandcastle, a mini sort of sandy molehill. And it's something that we've not really done in Scotland is, is go out and look for these wonderful, colourful uh, caterpillars by day, trying to find these little sandy mounds adjacent to, to creeping willow or perhaps other plants. So it's a species we're going to try and run some workshops on and try and encourage recording. These are some of the other species that make up the, uh, the 24 in Scotland that we're hoping to work on. So we have uh, Periclepsis cinctana, which only occurs on Tyree. We've called it the Tyree twist. So anybody going to Tyree, we really need you to go and look for this moth. It's the only place in the UK that it occurs. Uh, Patrick has been doing some monitoring of Carutis diana, the Afric twitcher, that only occurs in Glen Afric, although we found one spinning up Glen Strathfara this year. Surely it must be far more widespread than that. Uh, for clear wings, uh, Welsh clear wing, large red belted clear wing, and the, the newly uh, discovered uh, white barred clear wing in Scotland at Lockhart, they're all priority species. So we're hoping to run uh, workshops on training workshops online and then actually meet out on site and look for these species with pheromones. And we're going to continue our work with Kentish Glory. Um, we have landfill funding to do some management work at a site just north of Aviemore. And again, I'm sure that we'll be looking for volunteers to help with monitoring the, the moth there, but also actually with the, with the management of some of the scrub there because the site is slowly turning into to woodland. And uh, we also received some funding from Highland Council's uh, Nature Recovery Fund to do some work at Logie Quarry near Tain. Uh, we run a couple of work parties there with the Highland branch. And you can see here the lovely happy volunteers having popped lots of birch and um, broom and pine. Uh, but we've now got money for contractors to go in and open up some of these areas. Um, but we're having a butterfly day there so that we can look and record and monitor. The two key species are small blue and dingy skipper. And we're hoping to get some local people along as well. We're hoping to have a nice sort of butterfly celebration day so that we can um, highlight the importance of these open spaces in this quarry to the local community. And uh, just a reminder of uh, Anthony's workshops there, he's already mentioned them, but they're all online 10 o'clock on those particular dates. Um, and if you want to go and see butterflies for real, then we're, now that we're allowed to go out and play, on the 2nd of April, Anthony is running one of his monitoring and identification workshops, but it's actually outside. So it's at, in St Andrews. In the morning, he's going to be in the glass houses um, explaining how to monitor and um, tips on identification. And then in the afternoon, they'll be skipping around the wonderful uh, grounds uh, looking for butterflies. Two of our big uh, national events, uh, the dates for next for this year. So Big Butterfly Count, where we try and encourage you to go out and record butterflies uh, for over that three week period for 15 minutes in your garden, in your park, anywhere outside. So please get involved with that. And the dates for Moth Night, I always call it National Moth Night because to me, any night I run a trap is Moth Night. But it's over the weekend of the 19th to the 21st of May. It's also going to involve day flying species. So we have some of our priority species that will be on the wing then. Things like small dark yellow underwing and netted mountain moth. So I think that's it from me. If you want to find out more about our events, if you go to our website and you'll see in the top right, if you see the hit click the events button, you'll then get this page and 
where it says search by branch, if you put Scotland in there and click search, you will again get a list of all the events that are happening in Scotland. So keep your eyes on that. Um, email us, I've put our generic email address. So if you want to get involved with any of the projects that I've mentioned, then just uh, ping us an email and that will then be forwarded to whoever's the most appropriate person to respond. And if you don't already subscribe, please subscribe to our quarterly Scottish e-newsletter. Uh, our next one is due out towards the end of the month, and that has all the news about upcoming events and reports back on um, feedback from previous events. So I think that's me. I will stop sharing and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that was a really nice call for volunteers and a mini ID session rolled into one. Uh, I really liked your photographs of very, very happy looking work party volunteers. I expect there might have been some cake involved um, in those ones. And it's great to hear that you found some other other Barry Praters across Scotland, because I've, I've always thought we needed to clone him. I've, we're running over a little bit, but I've got time for one quick question from David Mallow, who says, do you know about the large scale Aspen project based in Loch Winnock, Renfrewshire? I, I know a little bit about it because uh, they came up to, or some, if it's the same project, uh, they came up here to look at some of our Aspen stands and we had a meeting when I, with the Highland Aspen group when I was a member about uh, propagating Aspen. So uh, I do, I think. <laughs> That's great. And I can't see any other questions, just lots of people saying thank you for a great conference and talks. I'm really glad everybody enjoyed it. I can tell everybody's feeling motivated from all of the, the chat that's been going on in the side here. So uh, sadly, we've come to the end of our spring gathering now, and I'd like to extend a huge thanks to all of our speakers, moth handlers and staff members behind the scenes who made today possible. As always, Anthony has been managing the webinar uh, and Shona, our office manager, always manages to put together a great lineup for us. So thank you to both of them. And of course, thank you to you, to you as well for giving up your Saturday and asking lots of great questions. Uh, don't worry if you asked a question which we didn't have time to answer because we'll, we'll work through those and we'll, we'll send everything out shortly along with the link to the recording. I feel that today has been a really good balance between some very stark messages about climate change, but also some positive actions that you can start taking to help butterflies and moths. It's very easy to feel overwhelmed and to just talk about all the really nice things when we, we get together. So what we've heard today has been really important. And I hope you're all feeling enthused to make any small changes that you can to help. Certainly the windowsills in my house are all steadily becoming populated with seedlings and I'm going to be going in the garden later and doing some more seed sowing this afternoon. I think making our gardens, windowsills and doorsteps as inviting as possible to pollinators is certainly something that we can all be thinking about right now and, and getting started on. So whatever you are going to be doing this Saturday, I hope you have a lovely weekend. Take care and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.